We'd like to call this evening's meeting of the Peoria City Council to order. Welcome. Uh, You've been 30 years old. Not seeing H. Wayne Wilson here, but uh, listening on to WCBU as well as Cable Channel 22. Uh, Madam Clerk, the council microphones are open for roll call. Mayor Artis. Here. Council Member Akison. Council Member Sear. Here. Council Member Grayeb. Council Member Jensen. Council Member Montalongo. Council Member Moore. Council Member Euler. Here. Council Member Riggenbach. Here. Council Member Ruckriegel. Here. And Council Member Turner. You have a quorum present, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. We'd like to invite everyone to join us and stand for a moment of silent prayer or silent reflection, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. We have two proclamations and a presentation this evening, and we're going to start off. Uh, I'm going to ask Councilman Grave to join me at the center podium for the uh, 65th summer season of Cornstock Theater. Rebecca was going to try to hide out. She said she's back of the house now. And I told her she's not at City Hall. So, Whereas Cornstock Theater has raised their tent in Upper Bradley Park in preparation for their 65th summer season of sensational, tent-sational entertainment, and whereas in excess of 6,000 hands clapping will be heard in the park for each of Cornstock's five summer productions, and whereas more than 400 volunteers will be involved at Cornstock between now and September. And whereas Cornstock's partnership with the Peoria Park District has allowed the tent grounds to become a festive outdoor picnic area, offering dinner before each production provided by local food vendors. And whereas Cornstock is proud to be one of many local performing arts organizations that prove it will play in Peoria. Now, therefore, I, Jamardis, Mayor of the City of Peoria, join the members of the Peoria City Council in applauding the members of the Company of Cornstock Theater as they open another exciting season of summer entertainment commencing on June 1st in Peoria. So we have a number of our uh, friends from Cornstock that are going to say a couple words, but first I'd like to uh, ask Council Member uh, Grayeb uh, from the illustrious 2nd District to uh, say a few words as well. Well, uh, we are all very, very proud of Cornstock Theater. And to think that it's going on 65 summers. 65 summers for Cornstock Theater. Think of all the volunteerism that we've had in this great city of Peoria all these years. And thanks to Rebecca Borland, who has done a lot of work in the area of the arts. Uh, this was brought to my attention, and we decided, the mayor and I decided, that we would have to do a proclamation. And Rebecca didn't balk. She didn't say, no, can't do that. But she did say she was going to send two other people who are already up here 
uh, for this very important occasion. Rebecca, I'd like to turn it over to you, and you can take it in for a landing. Thank you. And to think I didn't even audition. I would like to introduce our theater manager, Jennifer Parkhurst, and the president of our board, Pamela O'Rear, who will make some remarks. Thank you, Mayor Artis, City Council members, for the honor of this proclamation. The performing arts are alive and flourishing in Upper Bradley Park as Cornstack Theater enters into our 65th summer 10th season. We invite you all to attend either one or all of our shows this summer. And our theater manager, Jennifer Parkhurst, has a complimentary ticket for all of your city council members and mayor artists or of any of your show of your choice. And while Jenny is passing those out, I would like in the audience anyone who's associated with Cornstack to please stand. All those, a lot of Cornstackers here tonight. Cornstack, Cornstack Theater is proud to carry on the tradition of quality live theatrical experiences and sensational entertainment for our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mayor Artis, uh, you know, we have vocabulary words. Have you ever heard sensational? First time. Now we'd like to invite those here for the National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Whereas every day, 96 Americans are killed by gun violence, and on average, there are nearly 13,000 gun homicides every year. And whereas in January 2013, Hedaya Pendleton, a teenager who marched in President Obama's second inaugural parade, was tragically shot and killed just weeks later, should now be celebrating her 21st birthday. And whereas to help honor Hedaya and the 96 Americans whose lives are cut short and the countless survivors who are injured by shootings every day, a national coalition of organizations has designated June the 1st, 2018, the first Friday in June, as the fourth National Gun Violence Awareness Day. And whereas the idea was inspired by a group of Hadaya's friends who asked their classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange, chosen because hunters wear orange to announce themselves to other hunters when out in the woods, and orange is a color that symbolizes the value of human life. And whereas anyone can join this campaign by pledging to wear orange on June the 1st, 2018, to help raise awareness about gun violence and honor the lives of gun violence victims and survivors. And whereas we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and to encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our children safe. Now, therefore, I, Jim Artis, Mayor of the City of Peoria, Illinois, do declare uh, June the 1st, 2018 to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day in Peoria, Illinois. We have a number of uh, the local leaders of this initiative, and uh, M Michelle Nielsen Ott is going to uh, introduce uh, her associates and also say a few more words about the Awareness Day. Thank you. Um, thank you to uh, Mayor Artis and to the City Council for um, proclaiming June 1st as uh, National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Um, I'm a co-lead of the local group Bombs Demand Action, and we are just one of the gun violence prevention groups um, that is um, sponsoring this day to wear orange. And so we urge you all to wear orange on June 1st and the following weekend, um, the 2nd and 3rd, um, in honor of um, 
the, those who have lost their lives to um, gun violence and as well as to bring awareness to this um, issue. And I brought with me um, several women from the Moms Demand Action Group, though you do not have to be a mom or a woman to join. And so um, we thank you for your um, support of our initiative. Thank you. I'm going to ask the clerk and uh, Mr. Lewis to come down and uh, join us for uh, a very special uh, presentation of a historic um, piece of uh, artifacts from uh, Peoria's history. Uh, there's a little bit of story that goes with this that, uh, that you're going to hear about, and then we're going to have a presentation. Uh, and thanks in advance to uh, Mr. Lewis uh, for being civic-minded and putting the gavel uh, back here at City Hall. So the clerk is going to give us more information, and then we'll ask Mr. Lewis to say a few words. Good evening. Um, the item that's sitting before our podium tonight is Mayor Woodruff's gavel, and it has been returned to the city of Peoria by Mr. Lewis, and uh, like the mayor said, he will be speaking in just a moment. But just a brief information about Mayor Woodruff. Uh, he was the mayor for 24 years between the years 1903 and 1945. He was elected 11 times. Now, not consecutively, of course. So um, in those days, there were one-year and two-year terms. So there were many of those between 1903 and 1945. His last term was a four-year term, and it was, when it, it was the first four-year term. Uh, and that was in 1941. But a quote from Mayor Woodruff, it uh, states, some vice is bound to exist in every community. Under municipal control and regulations, such activities could be required to help defray the cost of civic maintenance and improvements. Um, most of Mayor Woodruff's planning and thinking was done on board his boat called the Bum Boat. The boat was never in the water. It was a houseboat on the river's edge where he left to meet with his cronies and his political enemies. This gavel that sits in front here uh, used, was used in his final term as mayor and was presented to Mayor Woodruff by his bum boat gang. So uh, Pat Lewis is here with us tonight. He is the one that's donating this back to the city of Peoria, and uh, I'll let him explain how he came to have this in his possession. I want to express my appreciation to the mayor and city council, and especially to the wonderful Beth Ball, for providing the opportunity to return this very interesting piece of Peoria history back to its original home in this grand and historic structure. It was over 75 years ago Mayor Woodruff received this gavel from his unofficial cabinet, the Boys of the Bumbo. It was the honor, it was in honor of his election as Mayor of Peoria, his 11th term. I recommend you uh, Google the Bumbo and Mayor Woodruff. It is an interesting read. I think it'll give you a more balanced view of the mayor's contributions to the growth of Peoria. He really was an extraordinary man. In May of 1945, Mayor Woodruff and this gavel left this building, and the exact path that this artifact took to return full circle is mostly unknown. What is known is the last three owners. I received this as a bequest from my childhood friend, Charles Pittman. I always called him Chucky. His children brought it back to Peoria with their parents' cremains, and now its final owners are the citizens of Peoria. Thank you. Councilman Grab. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the minutes of the regular joint city council meeting held on May 8, 2018, as printed. Uh, thank you. The motion is seconded by Councilmember Turner. Uh, any corrections or changes to the minutes? Seeing none, please cast your ballots. 
The motion passes unanimously. Madam Clerk. We have a couple of township items to handle first. 18-131 is a request to approve the monthly anticipated expenditures for June 2018 for the town of the city of Peoria. Uh, Trustee Grab. Chairman, I move to approve. Uh, seconded by Trustee Turner. Discussion on this item? Seeing no lights, please cast your ballots. The motion passes unanimously, Madam Clerk. 18-132 is a requ uh, request from the township supervisor to approve a resolution for the town of the city of Peoria to authorize a donation to the Peoria County Veterans Memorial Fund and to the Save a Child Fund. Yeah. Trustee Gribb. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve. A uh, motion to approve, seconded by Trustee Sear. Uh, discussion on this item. Seeing none, please cast your ballots. That motion passes unanimously. Madam Clerk. We're at the consent agenda. 18-133 is a communication from the city manager and director of public works with a request for the following. A is to approve the renewal of a contract with cut above tree service for tree move removal by size and tree and brush trimming by hourly rates in an amount not to exceed $170,000. And B is to approve the renewal of a contract with Gymax Landscaping for emergency tree and brush trimming by hourly rates in an amount not to exceed $30,000. 18-134 is a request to approve the renewal of an existing liability coverage with Argonaut uh, through Ar Arthur Gallagher Risk Management Services at a one-year cost of $164,222 and to add cyber liability coverage with ACE Insurance at a cost of $12,643 and crime coverage with Hanauer insurance at a cost of $2,597. 18-135 is a request to approve and authorize the execution of a one-year contract with Pinnacle Data Systems in an amount not to exceed $145,000 to provide utility billing, printing, and mailing services. 18-136 is a request to approve and authorize the execution of a one-year contract with First Tech Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $35,000 to provide lockbox services. 18-137 is a communication from the city manager and manager of emergency communications with a request for the following. A is to approve a five-year dispatch services agreement between between the City of Peoria and the City of Chillicothe. And B is to adopt an ordinance amending the City of Peoria 2018-2019 biennial budget relating to the general fund to recognize the receipt of funds and the corresponding expenditure of funds relating to the intergovernmental agreement with Chillicothe to provide dispatch services in the amount of $110,425. 18-138 is a communication from the city manager and director of community development with a request for the following. A is to approve an incumbency certificate and resolution accepting a grant from the uh, Illinois Housing Development Authority for the Abandoned Residential Property Municipality Relief Fund in the amount of $106,164. And B is to adopt an ordinance amending the City of Peoria 2018-2019 biennial budget uh, relating to the capital fund to recognize the receipt of the grant in the amount of $106,164. 18-139 is a request um, to concur with the recommendation from the Planning and Zoning Commission and staff to adopt an ordinance approving a special use in a Class R6 multi-family residential district for a school for the arts for property located at 919 Northeast Jefferson Avenue. 
18-140 is a request to concur with the recommendation from the Planning and Zoning Commission and staff to adopt an ordinance rezoning property from a Class R4 single family residential district to a Class CG general commercial district for property uh, at 2311 South Ligonier Street, uh, also known as 4201 Southwest Adams Street. 18-144 is a request to adopt an ordinance providing for the issuance of general obligation bond series 2018B in an aggregate amount not to exceed $10 million of the city of Peoria to provide for certain capital improvements within the city and providing the levy of a direct annual tax sufficient to pay the principal of and interest on said bonds. 18-142 is a request to approve the site application for a Class H temporary outdoor liquor license from the Peoria Friendship House of Christian Service for an event to be held at 411 Hamilton Boulevard on Saturday, June the 9th, 2018. 18-143 is a request to approve the site application for a Class A tavern liquor license on with an on-site consumption and retail sale of alcohol with a subclass of 1A, which is 2 a.m. closing hours at last call, 4201 Southwest Adams, also known as 2311 South Ligonier, contingent upon approval of a pending request to rezone with a re recommendation from the Liquor Commission to approve. 18-144 is a request to approve the site application for a Class A tavern liquor license with on-site consumption and retail sale of alcohol at P. Mills Bar and Lounge, 807 Southwest Adams, with a recommendation from the Liquor Commission to approve. 18-145, is, are the re, is the reappointment by Mayor Artis to the Greater Peoria Mass Transit District Board of Trustees with a request to concur of Maxine Wortham. 18-146 is a reappointment by the Mayor to the Fire and Police Commission of Jada, Janda Carter and Thomas Jackson. 18-147 are the reappointments by the Mayor to the Construction Commission at, with a request to concur of John Dillon and Tom DeGerald. 18-148 is the reappointment by the mayor to the Zoning Board of Appeals of Lawn Lyons. 18-149 are the reappointments by the mayor to the Sister City Commission of Jeff Boss and Leo Jordan. 18-150 are the reappointments and appointment by the mayor to the Public Arts Advisory Commission of Jonathan Romaine, Perry Johnson, and Bill Conger. 18-151 are the reappointments by the mayor to the Solid Waste Disposal Committee of City Treasurer Patrick Nicktine and Council Member Zach Euler. 18-152 is the reappointment by the mayor to the Riverfront Program and Policy Advisory Committee of Patrick Sullivan. 18-153 is the reappointments by the mayor to the Transportation Commission of George uh, Garib and Nathaniel Hers, Patrick McNamara. 18-154 is the reappointment and appointment by the mayor to the Historic Preservation Commission of Deborah Dordery and David Stoltz. 18-155 are the reappointments by the mayor to the Liquor Commission of Steve Corey II and Council Member Eric Turner. 18-156 are the reappointments by the mayor to the Mayor Advisory Committee for Citizens with Disabilities of Michael Van Cleve and Kay Barry. 18-157 are the reappointments by the mayor to the Municipal Band Commission of Lee Winger, Don Baker, and Mary Barthel. 18-158 are the reappointments by the mayor to the Peoria Housing Authority of Renee Andrews, Carl Cannon, and James Fasino. 18-159 are the reappointments to the Peoria Public Library Board of Trustees of Edward Barry, Stephen Buck, and Tiffany Duncan. 18-160 are the reappointments by the Mayor to the Planning and Zoning Commission of Michelle Anderson, Eric Hurd, Richard 
Yunus. 18-161 are the reappointments and appointments by the mayor to the cons Constitution Garden Advisory Committee of Molly Bright, Wendy Faulkner, Susan Grant, Jeanette Cozier, Brandon Goodman, David Berry, and Cindy Bertino. 18-162 is the reappointment and appointments by Mayor Artis to the Peoria Urban Forestry Advisory Board of Michael Gary Wilkins, Becky Cobb, Haley Brewer, and Matt Freeman. 18-163 are the reappointment and appointment by Mayor Artis to the Advisory Committee on Police and Community Relations of Savino Sierra and Haley Brewer. 18-164 are the reappointments and appointments by Mayor Artis to the Fair Employment and Housing Commission of Christopher Bailey, Barry Robinson, David McGinty, and Carl Holloway. 18-165, <clears throat> is the reappointments by Mayor Artis to the Advisory Commission on Human Resources of Wayne Cannon and Jessica Zabarek. Zober, Zoback. 18166 are the appointment is the appointment by Mayor Artis to the Police Pension Fund Board of Trustees with a request to concur of City Treasurer Patrick Nicktine. And 18-167 is the report by the City Treasurer Patrick Nicktine for the month of April with a request to receive and file. And that completes your consent agenda. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, any items to remove from consent this evening? Councilman Moore? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Items 18, 133, 138, 139, 143, and 144. Thank you. Okay, I had uh, 133, 138, 139, 143, and 144. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Sear. Item number 18, 141, please. 141, okay. Council Member Graham. Uh, 145. And uh, Council Member Jensen. Um, 18, 146, 147, 148, actually just 146 all the way through 167. Councilmember Montalongo. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, items 18, 135, and 136. Okay. 35, 136. There's only a couple left. Does anybody want to pull those off? <laughs> okay. We have a motion to approve the remaining items. Uh, Councilmember Riggenbach, seconded by Councilmember Turner. Please cast your ballots. Motion passes unanimously. Madam Clerk. 18-133 is the approval of the renewal of the contract with Cut Above Tree Service and also the contract with Gymax Landscaping. Okay. Uh, that was Council Member Moore. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this question is for uh, Director Reese. Um, can you uh, ex express to us what the minority percentage of employment is for each of the companies that are listed for renewal? I'm a little more familiar with Gymax and understand what, what they're doing there, and I see what they're doing every day, so I'm, 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 I'm pleased with what I'm seeing with Gymax. So this is primarily for uh, a cut above. Yes, uh, so we've had some discussions with the cut above because we have some, we had some concern. Currently their workforce is made up of six individuals um, with one being a female and five white males. Uh, so they were at 12% uh, female participation and 0% minority participation. But as we looked back through um, when this contract was originally awarded, we only had one bidder and they were holding their prices. So we had some fear if we went back out to bid that the prices would increase um, it, that we didn't have budgeted for because we budgeted based off these numbers. So the fear allowed us to take a number from a company that you know, I'm sure there are other companies out there who may have a better minority percentage. Um, I, I would hope that uh, we are not 
running our city based upon the fear that somebody might come to us with a higher rate. Rather, we are selecting a company that's, that is trying to be reflective of our city the way we're trying to be reflective of our city. Um, on this particular, do you know if um, the percentage, the 12 percent, the only woman that's there, was the same as it was last year? Yes, that's what it was last year. And how many years has we, have we had this contract? We started this contract in 2015. Okay. So um, it's okay to say to the people who are listening out there that next year we are looking for someone who has perhaps a better um, minority percentage in their company that can also provide good value and good work for us uh, that will come in at, at a reasonable cost and that we will be not held hostage by the fear that a company will raise their rates because we're asking them to do uh, to reflect the city the way we're trying to reflect the city and what we're doing. Is that correct? We would Thank you. With that, I move for approval. Okay. Motion to approve. Seconded Council Member Riggenbach. Uh, is there further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please cast your ballots. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Madam Clerk. 18135 is the contract with Pinnacle Data Systems. Uh, that was Council Member Montalongo. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have a concern both with 18135 and 136 that we're getting ourselves into a, a contract. Um, I'm hoping. Um, Concerning the stormwater utility, um, it's something I, I know we certainly have some water runoff issues, um, but I've, in the past I've, I've disagreed with the uh, funding formula that, we, that was brought to us. I disagree with the, the credit policy as well, and I'm hoping that sometime maybe over the summer, uh, and certainly by fall time, that uh, we can, whether it's me or a group of us, bring something forward uh, to change what this uh, funding amount is, which may have an impact on this um, contract, I guess, if we're signing something for long term. Um, but anyway, um, I won't be supporting 18135 or 136 and, and 141, so uh, I will not be supporting this tonight. Anyone else uh, or a motion on this? Move to approve, Councilman Riggenbach, seconded, uh, Councilman Turner. No further discussion, I'm seeing no lights. Please cast your ballots. Motion passes with 10 ayes, one nay. Councilmember Montalongo. Madam Clerk. 18-136 is the uh, one-year contract with First Tech Incorporated. Councilman Montalongo. Same comments as the last. I won't okay. be supporting this tonight. Uh, further discussion? Motion. Councilman Riggenbach, seconded by Councilman Turner. Discussion on this item? Uh, seeing none, please cast your ballots. Motion passes with 10 ayes, 1 nay. Councilmember Montalongo. Madam Clerk. 18-138 is the um, two parts, the resolution... Um, for the abandoned residential property multi, uh, municipality relief fund and then the budget item that goes with it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Moore. Do you, need, do you need two motions? Yes, we do, thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you. Um, with this item, this is uh, great news that um, oftentimes uh, we feel like we don't hear enough great news about 61605. And this is good news. And I wanted to take a, a moment or two uh, for this information to be represented to the council and the community to let you know that uh, we are continue to work to try to, to build up um, the 61605 community in addition to other parts of the first district. Um, but I will say what I've always said that we can't demolish our way to economic prosperity in any area, uh, and that goes for 61605. Um, but in this particular case, um, there are properties that um, I don't have to tell you, if you live in 61605, you may have been living next door to something that has been vacant and abandoned and a, a eyesore for not a couple of months or a couple of years, but for perhaps decades. 
and it's time to get this out of here. And as we continue to move forward with uh, developing the, the south side and the 61605 uh, zip code, this is going to be a, a real move forward to it. So if I could have uh, Assistant Director Doolin speak to a little bit about this. I, I will also acknowledge my thanks to Joe because he wor is working hard for the folks in the 1st District and particularly the uh, south side. Uh, there's not a time I can't, I don't call him or email him or text him that he gets back to me, and he is very responsive, and I, I really appreciate, I want to take this time to say I appreciate what you do and what your staff are doing, and I'm not saying Joe's perfect. I'm not saying the staff is perfect, and he knows that, um, but we have come a long way, and so Joe, can you speak to this item, please? Thank you for the, the kind comments. Uh, I will say normally I'm just the messenger and I'm passing that on to, to my staff who usually are the ones out delivering the service and, and they're very busy and doing a great job for the city of Peoria. Uh, the item in front of us is a grant that we received through um, IDA. It's a competitive grant. Um, there's a certain percentage uh, designated for the Chicago area and then a competitive grant for the rest of the state of Illinois. Uh, this grant is paid for by uh, foreclosure filing fees by banking institutions when they foreclose in the state of Illinois. It goes into a separate fund at the state, uh, so the state of Illinois can't touch it. Uh, it's specifically for demolition. Um, this grant is round three of the grant. Previously, we were awarded um, the first round, we received $75,000. Round two, we received $150,000, and this is round three, and we're receiving about $100,000. Uh, so through those three grants and our BRP, which is the Blight Reduction Grant, we've had about a million dollars extra in the last three years uh, from state of Illinois for demolition within 61605. Uh, this will allow us to tear down about an additional 12 to 15 properties in 61605 with this money. Uh, hopefully within, uh, I'm sure we'll get them down by July because we are uh, with our contractor, we are demolishing at a very fast pace. Uh, but like Councilman Moore said, uh, demolition is usually our last, uh, our last priority to get things done. Uh, before we go through demolition process, we walk through the house with a realtor and the salvage company to ensure that the property cannot be saved. Unfortunately, uh, when properties are left sitting for even only one or two years, they can be come almost unsavable, especially in a market that has uh, a struggling market. So um, that's what this grant is. Thank you for that explanation. I, I do appreciate it. Those, uh, I've talked to a number of people in the first district who wonder why they can't be uh, informed when a house is on the demo list so that they could perhaps purchase it and try to renovate that house. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yes, so all of our demolition, um, you know, council has approved a 30-day waiting list for all of our demolitions. Before each demolition, we put a sign in front of the house that says, please call us if you are interested in, in saving the property. In addition, if you go to PeoriaCodeViolations.com, all of our uh, upcoming demolitions are posted. Um, we are very happy if anyone is interested in saving house to show them the house and if they can show to us that um, you know they have the knowledge and, and the experience and the finances to save the house. Um, whether it's for an individual or a nonprofit agency, we're happy to work with them. Uh, if anyone's listening and, and has some interest in that, they can call the Community Development Department, Development Center, 494-8600, and ask to talk to our land development manager, Eric Setter. So that number was 8494-8600. Correct. And who do they ask for? Eric Setter. Eric Setter. Yep. I'm sure Eric would be glad you mentioned his name. Thank you so much for that. Um, so with that, I like, thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to move for approval of item A. A uh, motion to approve, seconded Councilman Turner. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Seeing none, please cast your ballots. Uh, that motion passes unanimously and uh, Councilman Moore on item B. I'd like to move for approval. Motion to approve, seconded uh, Councilman Regenbach. Uh, is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, please cast your ballots. And that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Madam Clerk. 18-139 is the ordinance uh, for the special use for the School of Arts on Northeast Jefferson Avenue. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Moore. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to move for a deferral of this item. Uh, the reason being, I attended the zoning meeting when this was talked about. And at that zoning meeting, when it was all said and done, at least three times it was indicated that this item would be brought before council on June the 12th. Uh, imagine my surprise when I saw that it was on the agenda for May 22nd. Uh, so in all fairness, that is what the, the community left with 
at, after that meeting was over. So uh, I'd like to defer to June the 12th. Okay. Uh, seconded by Councilmember Turner. Is there a discussion on the deferral? Seeing none, please cast your ballots. The motion passes unanimously. Madam Clerk. 18141 is uh, the ordinance for the geo bonds. Uh, that was Council Member Sear. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple questions here for our city manager. Uh, what's the life expectancy of the HVAC system that we're talking about for the library here? I believe that the, the current system that they have is well over 20 years old. I think it's, it might be original to the building, so it's, uh, that HVAC system is probably closer to, to 50 years old. So um, the intent behind this replacement, as we discussed during the budget process, would be that, that, that this would be a, a long-term capital project. We would issue the, the, the debt for this and that it would be repaid over time. Thank you. That was my main concern because I didn't want to I think we want to have a bond, 20-year-old bond, at 5.5% for something that would not at least have a life expectancy of 20 years. I do want to uh, let's say I'm a little concerned also about our budget, which will be later. Uh, along the same line as uh, Councilman Malongo, some of these uh, bonds will be repaid with the uh, stormwater utility fee. And, uh, and just I'm not sure how an HVAC system save uh, money for, for uh, for our stormwater utility fee. But the, the one and a half million dollars for the HVAC system comes out of, uh, would be a, paid for by the library out of, out of a different pot. What we've done is we've aggregated all of these bond issuances together. Uh, so you have sewer funds, you have stormwater utility funds, you have, I think, some capital funds that are included in there, and then you have the library funds. Um, but we're aggregating in order to, to save on the debt issuance costs into one bond issue. Move to approve, Mr. Mayor. Motion to approve, seconded by Councilmember Ruck Regal. Uh, are there any additional uh, comments on this item? Seeing none, please cast your ballots. Councilman Oiler, thank you. Uh, the motion passes with 10 ayes, 1 nay. Councilmember Montalongo, Madam Clerk. 18143 is the request to approve the site application for last call at 4201 Southwest Adams. Councilmember Moore. Mayor, I will preface my comments by saying that uh, the comments I'll make for this item uh, will pertain also to the next item, and I will just move into the next item um, as I plan to move for approval for both of these, but I wanted to make comments first. Um, to the petitioners for both of these properties, uh, I just think it is important for me to express to you that uh, the folks on the south side where the, both of these properties are located, one in the warehouse district and one on the far south side, um, the people uh, who reside, who own homes, who rent homes, who go to school and go to work, have absolutely zero tolerance for, um, I'll say, shenanigans when it comes to um, liquor establishments. Uh, it is um, something that has caused a lot of consternation in the first district. And um, although I wish you much, much success, uh, you need to know that you will be watched and you will be uh, monitored just like we do every other establishment here. You won't have any extra oversight than any other establishment. However, you must know that the people in these communities are, are putting a lot of money into this community. Um, they are, this is their home, this is where they're from, and they have no um, patience for a business that will come in and will not be a good neighbor. So if you will be a good neighbor with the community, they will be a good neighbor with you. But the moment something happens, trust me, they will be attempting to call me because oftentimes they, they may not be able to get a hold of me on the phone, but email's always there. Everyone around this council will be contacted. The mayor will be contacted. And we will come down on you uh, uh, if last call 
or P Mills Bar and Lounge, uh, if you fail to uphold the uh, requirements of your site approval, your site application, and running your business, there will be no peace. You need to understand that. We will make sure that we rein you in and have you operate just like every other business operates. So once again, let me say, you won't receive any special attention unless your failure to run your establishments properly warrant it. I live in the south side. I drive around all the time. I drive around the, the, first, the, the North Valley and the downtown and warehouse district all the time, late at night, early in the morning. So it won't be that somebody said you're doing something. Most likely when they call or text me, I'm, I'm probably already out and I will see it for myself. So thank you for having faith in the South Side in the First District to start your businesses. But we expect for you to be a good neighbor. With that, I move for approval of 18143. Okay. Uh, seconded by Councilmember Turner. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Seeing none, please cast your ballots. The motion passes unanimously, and Councilwoman Moore on um, 144. Motion to approve, seconded, Councilman Turner. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, please cast your ballots. That uh, motion passes unanimously. Madam Clerk. Um, the next, um, let's see here. 18-145 through 18-166 are all the appointments. 145 was Councilman Grib. Councilman Grib. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, Mayor Artis, uh, I count here tonight um, some 54 uh, splendid appointments, and um, just thought I would pick out 145 because that's the first one with Maxine Wortham career educator. We worked together in the early 80s at Manuel High School as deans. And could you just outline for the public and the council uh, how important these appointments are for the city and what, um, how time consuming it is for you to make these and then bring these to the attention of the council and the input you ask of the council in, in making these appointments? Thank you, uh, Councilman. Um, well, I, I'm glad you pulled off uh, this one in particular. Uh, Maxine Wortham is, is certainly a person who has served in our community for decades. And uh, after uh, retirement, she wanted to continue her service and has done a great job for us on the CityLink board. Uh, and she brings uh, a wealth of, of uh, community experience and community knowledge to the board. Uh, and also brings uh, diversification that we're trying to accomplish throughout these boards. Uh, we all know, uh, at least on the council know, that uh, typically in uh, the May-June time frame and then again uh, in the fall, typically October, November, uh, we have uh, uh, most of our commission uh, appointments and reappointments. So it's a, it's a pretty big uh, task for our staff to uh, contact all the um, uh, currently serving members of all the boards and commissions to gauge whether or not they would like to continue serving or maybe uh, step off or look at a different commission. Uh, and then for the vacancies that we have, contacting the literally hundreds of people that have submitted profile, uh, which is basically just uh, contact information, uh, expressing interest in, in serving on some of these boards and commissions, which is why on many of these we see appointments and reappointments. So there's a, there's a combination of both. Uh, maybe to uh, complicate it just a little bit more this year with the change in the staffing in the mayor and manager and council office, uh, the people that typically handle uh, these, uh, all of this information changed. So we had a new person trying to understand the system and find all the names and so on. So uh, there was, uh, it was an extra challenge, uh, but they, they got through it. I think all the appointments were made on time. And then uh, as, maybe just as a final comment, typically what, what will happen is when we get near to tonight, when we make the majority of these appointments, if there are uh, several commissions that have uh, openings still, 
uh, I will send out that in, uh, information to the council as I did a week or two ago, saying we still have some vacancies. If you have any uh, constituents in interested in serving, uh, please let um, staff know so we can uh, get them plugged in. I, I'm not, I wasn't expecting the, the question, but it, hopefully that answered uh, what you were looking for, Councilman. Thank you very much. And, and for those people who are appointed manager, it's you or your designees who reach out and give them the packets and, and the orientation they need and the first meeting they need to attend uh, uh, each, um, each time we do this. And you're nodding your head in agreement, so that is good. And thank you, Mayor, for expounding on these many appointments. These are exceedingly important appointments, so whether it's the Library Board, the Historic Preservation Commission, the Construction Commission, we go right on down the line, fair employment. Uh, and having high caliber, top flight people in these commissions makes our job easier. And thank you, Mayor Artis, for bringing these appointments forward tonight, some 54. So uh, on this item, we have motion for to approval to approve, seconded by Councilmember Ruck Regal. Uh, is there any additional uh, discussion on this item? Seeing none, please cast your ballots. That motion passes unanimously, Madam Clerk. Okay, 18-146 um, through 18-166 are all the appointments. You also included 167, which is the city treasurer's report. Did you want, intend to, okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood correctly. So these are all the uh, appointments and reappointments by Mayor Artis to the various commissions. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Councilwoman Jensen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I just... I had all of these pulled because I just wanted um, to make a point, um, and I do plan, of course, to support all of these and, and to make a motion to approve each appointment. But as I was you know, looking through this bulk of 54 appointments, um, I noticed, I mean, it stuck out to me that only 17 of those 54 appointments are women. Um, if you exclude the Constitution Garden Committee, only 12 of the 46 appointments are women. And I know this council's made a commitment um, to ensure that our staff is more diverse and that our city re reflects, our city staff and employees reflect, or more accurately reflect the makeup of our city. So I just, you know, for the future, and I know we're, we're, we're all part of it because we're making recommendations to you just for all of us to be aware that it would be good if we could get more diversity of gender, race, sexual orientation, and even geographic location as to where people live on our commissions. So if we make an effort um, to make our commissions um, and committees that we appoint members to, that's something we should strive for. And with that, then I, I move. I don't know if I can move to. We can move to approve the, the, all of those. We will record them separately. If you don't, if there's no objection, just make one motion and vote for. All so of them. I, okay, I move to um, approve items 1846 through 18166. And that was seconded by Councilmember Ruckerigal. Thank you, and Councilman Jensen. I appreciate your comments. And uh, uh, just to, to keep in mind, these uh, 50 uh, some odd appointments uh, do not represent the majority of the people that serve on commissions. This is just a, a, a sampling of the people that serve and uh, the appointments that are due. Uh, and I um, continue to uh, and encourage council members to urge constituents that want to get involved. Every time that I go to a neighborhood meeting, uh, I try to mention that uh, because there are a lot of people that want to participate. And, and some of the commissions are extremely high profile with a lot of work and some of them are just a little bit more specialized but as Councilman Graeb said every one of them at some point in time saves us a tremendous amount of time and information gathering and work that we would have to, to do that that the commissions provide to us so I would uh, just reinforce uh, Councilman Jensen uh, said to encourage council members to encourage uh, folks to uh, look at those commissions and, and uh, surely uh, provide us a notification of their interest to serve on those. So we have uh, a motion and a second. If I'm seeing no more lights, please cast your ballots. 
That motion passes unanimously. Madam Clerk. Um, since 18167 was not polled, we'll go to the first readings. 18-168 uh, is the first reading review of an ordinance amending Chapter 15 of the Code of the City of Peoria relating to noise. Okay. Uh, Council Lice, did you want to give us a brief overview of this? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, currently, uh, the only um, restaurants or bars that can have live music instruments um, exist currently in the B1 or downtown business uh, district area. Uh, this amendment would allow um, restaurants and bars in C2 um, zoning areas areas such as Evergreen Square Shopping Center, Junction City Shopping Center, Metro Center Shopping Center, Northwoods Mall um, to have uh, play uh, live music uh, up till 11 o'clock just as it is in B1. Um, I know this was done. I know that uh, council members have been approached um, by businesses and these restaurants who wish to have live music until 11, just like we do currently have in B1. And so uh, I drafted pursuant to their request uh, this amendment. Okay, thank you. Uh, discussion on this item or uh, motion to receive and file? Uh, receive and file, Councilmember Moore, seconded Councilmember Regenbach. Is there any other discussion on this item? Ms. Jensen. Thank you. And I guess just because we're talking about this topic, um, I had some residents of the East Bluff ask about the music down at the riverfront. Um, I know we made adjustments last year so that it wouldn't be quite so noisy later on. And they just wanted, they just raised this issue last week. And I just wanted to make sure that we're working with the, um, the events downtown on the riverfront to make sure that it's not as bad as it was at the beginning of the summer last year. Maybe we can go under new business on that. Sure. that we'll just keep this item to uh, this item. We have a motion and a second. Please cast your ballots. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Madam Clerk. 18-169 is a first reading review of an ordinance amending Chapter 2, um, Article 5, Division 7, that pertains to uh, Public Safety Benefits Act of the Code of the City of Peoria. Uh, Council Eist. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor. The uh, purpose of this amendment uh, is to um, more clearly define for purposes of the city's um, policy regarding the, the granting of a catastrophic injury um, as defined by uh, the Public Safety Employee Benefits Act. The problem is, frankly, that it, it, that is not defined, a catastrophic injury is not defined by the, by the act itself. Therefore, the city, uh, using, utilizing its home rule authority, has defined catastrophic injury um, as an injury which permanently prevents an individual from performing any gainful employment. So the hope is that we provide some clarity uh, for the city's policy and to our employees. And there are certain other minor changes uh, in uh, this ordinance um, that had to do with uh, the type of benefits uh, and insurance plans that employees can expect uh, pursuant to PSEBA. Yeah, thank you. Uh, questions or a motion? Motion to receive and file Councilman Sear, seconded by Councilmember uh, Grab. Uh, seeing no lights for further discussion, please cast your ballots. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Madam Clerk. We're at regular business. 18-170 is a communication from the city manager and finance director, comptroller, with a request to receive and file a presentation report on the current status of the city's TIF uh, tax increment financing funds. And there are two handouts on your desk on yellow. One is a list of the TIF uh, funds, and it's one page. And then the other one is uh, the executive summary. And on page three of five, the changes are bolded. Okay. Uh, Director Scroggins, did you want to give an overview on this? 
Yeah. Yellow. Yellow. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, at the request of council, I think it was last week or last meeting that they requested some information regarding the city's tax increment financing uh, funds. Uh, I provided a, an executive summary that was done in conjunction with the Economic Development Department. Uh, Caesar did a great job pulling this stuff together, but the one correction that uh, the clerk uh, mentioned was on page three related to the amount of funds paid to the school district 150 regarding Velasca Hinton. Um, it should have read at the end that the final payment was made in the amount of 237,982 for a total of $4,249,982. Uh, that was part of the Southtown many years ago. So um, the other yellow page that was provided provides the um, ending projected balances for the end of this year of the obligated funds within each TIF. Um, currently, if you look, Central Business District TIF has a deficit, but those are just because those funds have been obligated. They haven't been spent as of yet, so by the time these contracts get paid through, there'll be funds coming in next year as well. But I wanted to reflect what was obligated through 2018. Um, at that, I'd be willing to answer any questions. Uh, Mr. Scroggins, could we make sure that this report is uh, on the on the city website and with, you know, some uh, notification of where they can find it? Sometimes we have people that um, have some difficulty. There's a lot of information here. They have problems navigating to it. So I'm not sure how uh, IT wants to do that, but this is uh, probably because there's been some discussion on this thing at the at the uh, Perry Public School Board lately. This is, uh, I think, good factual information for them to have. Uh, Mr. Manager, do you have a comment on that? I, I do, and I just want to I, I want to underscore something within the the report that was put together by Caesar in, in Economic Development, and that is if you turn to page four or five in the report when it talks about the, the growth of equalized assessed value in all of our TIFs. Um, the, the EAV growth in our, our TIFs uh, has average, averaged annually about 8.3%. Comparing that to the EAV growth in the entire city, which has grown on, on an average over that same period of time um, at about 5%. Um, and then if you look at, at the Peoria Public School EAV growth during that period, it's been 2.5 percent. So the, 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 the General Assembly established TIF as an economic development tool in order to grow the tax base. But for the TIF, the development wouldn't occur. So clearly we can look at this and it, the, just there in, the, in terms of EAV growth, you have evidence that, that but for the TIF, we would not likely see that type of growth occurring in those areas. Um, if you turn to page five in that summary, um, the bullet points in the middle of the, of the page talk about the fact that, that with Southtown as an example, that, that during the period of time that Southtown was started, from 1978 until it, until it concluded um, in 2013, um, one could say that the school district lost $2.4 million of revenue that would have come to them had that EAV grown. What actually happened it, at, at the rate that it was growing at, what actually happened because of the TIF is that once that, that development was completed, um, they were receiving $1.8 million a year. So within almost uh, 1.6 years, the school district was paid back because of that TIF. So, so TIFs do what they're intended to do, which is to provide that growth of economic development it is one of the most powerful tools that we have as an economic development engine inside the city. So I just wanted to point out some of those key points um, and underscore the, the, the importance that TIF plays in growing our tax base. Thank you. I have uh, Councilmember Regenbach first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just want to reiterate that. And I was involved with the establishment of the East Village Growth Cell TIF, and I can tell you that all of the stakeholders, the school district, the park district, and the county, we were all part of that discussion. And um, this isn't something that the city does lightly. And I think the but for that you mentioned, Mr. Manager, is something that we all need to keep in mind. And 
frankly, looking at the on page four or five again, you can see that even with the TIFs, some of these areas have lost EAV, in which case I, you can argue that the school district is better off having that TIF there because that continues to, to protect them. Um, many of us have students, children in Peoria Public Schools and the other school districts that encompass our city, so I can tell you that this isn't something that, that we do without weighing the cost and benefit to it. And um, obviously this is something that will continue to be discussed at cocktail parties throughout the city, I'm sure, going forward. But I think this is really some, some tangible data that's useful for all of us. So thank you for putting that together for us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Council Member Jensen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And Thank you, Mr. Scroggins and um, Mr. Yurick, and, and thanks to uh, Caesar. I was actually the council person who asked for um, this report, and it, it is very thorough, very helpful. Um, and I know you guys put a lot of work into it, so I appreciate it. You turning it around so quickly as well. Um, I do have some questions. Um, one of my, my questions, and I know it's touched upon a little bit in this, um, report back is the process um, when a, if a TIF is going to be extended by the 12 years, and I don't know if Mr. Scroggins or maybe um, you, Mr. York, can answer that. I know you touched upon it a little bit, but um, my question is whether there has to be a certain amount of notice before the city, if the city were to contemplating or considering an extension? Do they have to give the public a certain amount of notice? I assume they do, um, and I'm wondering what that is. Well, it, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to it. We can certainly look at that and find out. We, we do know that, that you know, TIFs run for 23 years. In order to extend it, you have to have a, a legislative approval by the General Assembly right. to extend the TIF. So in that, just by the nature of that process, it's going to take a while for that process to work through. Um, but I'll have to, I, I don't know the answer to your specific question. Is there a, a notice that we would take action uh, ahead of that? But we'll find that answer out and get back to you on that. Okay, and then connected to that, um, and, and it, in the little part that describes the procedures, if there is an extension, it doesn't mention, does there have to be another TIF public meeting or you know how when you initially approve a TIF is that required before going to the legislature or before the city makes the recommendation to extend it again a, a, another question I don't want to I don't want to give you the wrong answer so I'll just say we'll get that answer for you I have a couple more related um, to that can can the TIF be extended at any time during the 23 years or does it have to be like within the year that it's set to expire, and you may not know, but I'm wondering that as well. I don't know. Can you find that out too? Sure. Okay, um, let's see. I think. Let's see, okay, and then on some other, on another issue, it, it's touched upon a little bit in the memo. Um, with my work as representing school districts, I am familiar how, in fact, I was representing um, the Peoria Heights School District when they entered into their most recent, when the village of Peoria Heights entered into their most recent TIF. And as part of that, we negotiated an agreement with the village so that the increment would still be paid, at least a portion of it, to the school district. Um, and I know you talk about in here how I think we sort of did something like that with South town we haven't done that with any other TIF is that right that's uh, well no we have I, we have a we have a payment agreement in place with um, Peoria Public Schools in regard to the East Village growth so that okay. once once we get up to five hundred thousand dollars of fund balance in that that um, uh, TIF that ten percent I believe of any of the proceeds uh, that are generated would then be uh, segregated and sent to the district for them to to use in a jobs program in a, in a jobs training program okay so um, I guess my 
It's just something that I want the, the council to be aware of. That is something that we could do if we're contemplating any TIF in the future, is work out at least so a portion of the increment could continue to go to the school district or another taxing body if that's something that we want to consider. That's a policy question that council could certainly discuss. Okay. Um, hang on one second. I'm just reading my notes here. With regards to the, the handout that we got, um, which is one of the items that I asked for where you give us the balance, the projected balance left in each TIF. Um, and I, I kind of know the answer to this just from my work representing municipalities and school districts, but if there's a balance remaining in the TIF when it expires, can the city direct where that balance goes to or is it is it um, split up between the taxing bodies according to the proportion of their percentage of taxes? It, it, it's actually, it can go either way. You, you know, the, the, the city could certainly declare a surplus and then disseminate that money back, disperse it back to each one of the taxing bodies proportionally. Or, um, as is the case when we had the South Town uh, TIF, what we ended up doing is um, we identified some additional costs or additional programs that we wanted to address within the and, and projects that we wanted to fund within that TIF. We executed those. The remaining funds were then ported into another TIF, which they were ported into the South Village TIF. So those funds remain in, in uh, the South Side in the South Village TIF. So it's up to the council what happens to that if there's any balance remaining it's when the, it expires. It is a policy direction or policy decision of this body. So with regards to the one that is expiring at the end of the year, the, the riverfront, the Northside Riverfront TIF, which still has $608,708 in it, it would be up to the city council as to what would happen with any money that's left over. That is, that is correct. Um, with regards to that, is there, and you may not know this, a time frame where we have to make that decision within us? Uh, I think you could certainly tie it into the to the next budget process. I think we could we could, you know, build in that decision point at a time when you're talking about making funding decisions. That would be very appropriate to do it then. So this fall. Okay, but so there there isn't a statutory requirement that we decide what's going to happen to any leftover money within a certain amount of time from when the TIF expires? Um, again, I, I don't know specifically the answer, okay. but we'll get, we'll get you that one. Thank you. I think that's all I have at this, at this moment, but thank you very much. This is really good information for all of us to have as well as the public, so thank you. Uh, Councilman Gray up next. Um, thank you, Councilman Jensen, for asking for this report. <clears throat> um, manager, I, I know that there may be gaps in uh, your knowledge, but hopefully not in the knowledge of our corporation council. Um, if, there, if there are unexpended uh, monies, um, these monies may not be used for operations or capital for our city budget. Well, maybe I'll, I'll answer that and, and then I'll turn it over to, to the Corporation Council to elaborate. Um, if there might, well, let me say this. Inside the geographic boundaries of the TIF, which is what we, we did with Southtown, if there were uh, eligible infrastructure projects or eligible projects that we looked at that, that would be TIF eligible expenses, there's a, there's a laundry list of what you can spend TIF dollars on. We utilize those funds in that regard. So in the Northside Business Park TIF, which I think Northside, or Northside Riverfront TIF, which is the one that's going to be expiring in 2018, if there was sidewalk work that we needed to do in, in that area, we could certainly do that. If there was, uh, for example, we wanted to, to uh, improve bike trails in that area, that's something we might want to consider. Or if there's um, you know, some, some curb and gutter that we might want to put in on a street, there are things like that that we could certainly utilize those funds for that would alleviate the need of the, the city's uh, general fund from having, or the capital budget from having to, to pay for those costs. But, but 
um, in most instances, unless it's staff that is directly related to trying to work in, in, the, in the TIF, it's, there's, there's not a lot of costs that can go in. So right now in this current budget year, there is a small portion of the economic development team's uh, salaries are paid by TIF because that, that's an eligible, allowable expense under the law. He answered it better than I because essentially what he told you was sometimes yes and sometimes no. It's, it's determinable on a case-by-case -case basis, and so that would be the answer. Would it have to be um, spent in the geographic area that was actually TIFT? Let's say we had an emergency, uh, another big recession or whatever, and we were really crunched economically. I'm making this up now. It, 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 would, it, would, it would have to be the same geographic area. Yes. It have to be used in the same geographic area. Correct. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I had Councilmember Agusson next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've got a question um, about the negative um, projected balances. Can you explain that to me? Please. The funds, uh, so like the Central Business District, we've obligated those funds. We haven't spent them yet, but they have been budgeted for projects um, within the business district. So the timing of that, so we, we put them in because we need to adopt the contract. Let's say the contract's $2 million. We know we're not going to spend it all in that year, but in order to enter into a contract, we have to have a budget. So and come with the funding in 2018 or 19, that will help mitigate that $1.3 million. It's more of a timing thing. It's just reflecting that we've obligated all that and some of next year's as it comes on. Okay, so, um, and where will the money come from? We can just pay it over time then? Just pay the contracts when the money flows in? Right, well, it's just timing of the contract is coming from the property tax increment generated by the central business. Right, but tip. if the property tax is paid just, you know, right. once a year. So as it comes in, we'll pay the, pay those contracts off. So the, so the timing should be sufficient that we'll have the cash flow to make it through 2019 based on what our projected increment is. Okay, Some all of these right. projects will go from, they're not just all gonna get done this year. Okay, um, could, could staff, uh, send us an additional answer to a question, what can t tax increment financing monies be spent on? I think we'd appreciate that. How are these questions, who, who sent the questions and how did we arrive at these questions? I think what we, we tried to do is put together a primer and, and I think that staff had worked up um, just kind of uh, what I would call TIF 101 and trying to get some basic questions. And so they, they authored this in a way of trying to, to structure it. To, to so they questions. came up with questions that they thought people might Correct. have in mind? Okay. Um, that's good. And I thought that you can use TIF money, sweep it over into an adjoining TIF. That is correct. I, I mentioned so, earlier what we did with Southtown is right. we ported that money, we, we transferred it to an adjoining TIF, which was the South Village TIF. So yes, you can. But to Councilman Grabe's question, I think that your your answer was it had to be spent in that geographical area, and I think that well, it would have it would require an action of the council to move the money. Staff can't simply move those dollars to move them from one TIF to another. So it would require an act of, of the council to do that, which is what you did with Southtown when you transfer those funds over to allow those to then move into the South Village TIF. So the, the, the question, um, I, I, I guess what I, to, to clarify Councilman Graves' question and yours, you can't spend TIF dollars outside of the TIF, outside of the geographic boundaries of all of the TIFs that we have. So if, but it would, in order to spend those dollars, you would have to move them from one TIF to another if they're adjoining. Okay, oh, I, I'm asking the, I asked the question, I knew the answer, but I think it was um, for the public's interest, 
it was confusing because it sounded as if you were answering that the money must be spent in the geographical area of the boundaries of the TIF where the increment was collected. And we all know, and we have the benefit now of having Councilman Moore on the council. She came to the council meeting her very first time alerting us to the fact that she didn't really appreciate the concept of money being spent outside of the boundaries of the TIF that it was being collected in unless the community was engaged in how the money was spent. Is that right? So, I mean, it's on people's minds and I think it's important that we explain it. So now we've got all the TIFs touching each other, basically. I mean, many of them do. So we can s sweep money over um, and, you know, and I'm sure that it would be agreed upon if it was a good idea, but um, anyway, it, it just sounded kind of confusing. So that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Riggenbach was next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Manager, would you just clarify that? Because you, you can, my understanding has always been it has to be an adjoining geographic area, an adjoining TIF. So you can't move something from Eagle View to the warehouse district, can you? It could only go to the South Village. It, if, if the TIFs are all adjacent, yes, you can move the monies. Could take Eagle View to the north side business. Yes. Because they are adjoining. So the geographic area that we're talking about as is of the connected. collective TIFs. Correct which is still a somewhat limited area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman Moore is next. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just want to, speaking on behalf of the, um, the first district where of the, dist of the TIFs that are here, I believe the lion's share of them are in the first district. Um, Getting back to something that uh, Councilwoman Akinson mentioned, uh, when I came on council, one of the concerns from the South Town TIF was that there was money that the community didn't even know was available, didn't even know it was there. And with all the issues that are plaguing the 61605 uh, zip code, and funds are available to alleviate some of those and not even knowing that, it was, that the money was there, that was a, a, a eye-opening event for us. Uh, and it propelled me to where you see me sitting today. Uh, insofar as the TIFs that are, are, are in the first district, it would be my intent to make sure that those funds are spent in the first district in the areas that um, they are uh, generated from. In the, uh, when we talk about South Town TIF, South Town TIF was expiring. And because we were not aware that um, all that money was there uh, and all the need that was existing on the South Side, uh, luckily for us, the South Village TIF was established before I got on council and the money was then ported to the South Village TIF before I got on council. And since that time, we've been utilizing those funds continuing in the South Side to bring in improvements. Uh, and so I thank you for the explanation that because now all the TIFs touch, they can jump from point A to point M, but it is my um, assertion that uh, that will not happen on my watch because all of these areas have their own unique needs. And unless a TIF expires and the funds are not used, uh, I don't see any reason um, that other uh, items that you've talked about, uh, infrastructure improvements that are eligible uh, cannot be uh, completed using those funds because uh, as you saw from the report, the EAV is, a, is an issue that as it increases, it increases the, the amount of taxes that are coming back to the TIF and we were able to utilize those funds. I believe it was four million something that went back to the school district uh, and, and, and well deserving. The school district needs all the money they can get. Uh, and so I was glad to see that we were able to, to put that money back into the school district. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Riggenbach. <laughs> Thank you, the last time I promise. Uh, I just wanted to, um, 
applaud Councilwoman Moore for her comments about not on her watch, because when we established the East Village Grow Cell TIF, that was right in the wake of the discovery, if you will, of those funds in Southtown. And I think with the council that we have and the way we do TIFs today is so much different than it was in 1986 and 1999 and 1995 that that's not going to happen again. And I think all of us would make that commitment. And without sounding defensive, I, I don't want to continually pay for the sins of my fathers, if you will, that we, we've learned a lot of lessons through TIF development. Part of the East Village Grow Cell TIF has a Citizens Advisory Council that meets quarterly. These are not politicians, they're, they're business owners, they're, they're residents, they're folks who live and work and breathe in those neighborhoods that make up that TIF. So they're going to make sure that when um, 2034 comes around, there's not a one and a half million dollar surplus sitting there because we're going to be using that on an ongoing basis for the purpose that the TIF was created. And I think it's really unfortunate that we let the few examples of the past jade our view of the future. Because if, if we don't learn from our mistakes, we're doomed to repeat it, of course. But I would like to say we've learned from mistakes and going forward, we're in much better shape. And this is a great discussion. Um, I think it's, it's really worthwhile. But let's make sure that we, we keep our eye on where we're going with this and not just dwell on what went wrong in the past. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Grib. Uh, absolutely correct, uh, Councilman Riggenbach. Of these TIFs that are enumerated, uh, we've got um, all of them District 1 TIFs except two of them. Campus Town's been retired. So we know that where we have done most of our TIFs, it's been uh, some of the neediest uh, areas within our city. So I think this should help put to rest some of the notions that uh, the policymaking body of the city of Peoria through the many years we've been doing these TIFs has, that we've been doing this in a profligate way or an irresponsible way where there isn't a need. We have not been tiffing for golf courses and country clubs and things of that nature. And um, so I think it's important to uh, mention that as well as we take a look at these that are listed on the yellow sheet, the current tax increment financing districts in the city of Peoria. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Councilman Moore. Thank you, Ms. I'm sorry, Director, I do have a question regarding um, projected expenditures out of the South Village. Uh, I know that we've, in the last few months, have uh, allotted, um, I believe it's $450,000, 150000 each for the residential, commercial, and then the employment training programs. Is that $450,000 reflected in what the projected balance at the, the end of the year is, or is that still hanging out there because the program, as, as of this point, has been put on pause? You're talking about the work, work training programs? The residential, um, the residential um, rehab program that we project, that we uh, uh, approved $150,000 for. There was another $150,000 for a commercial rehab program. Right, those were done in 2017? No, the, those were in 2018. They haven't been, they started in 2017, you're right. Yeah, they so they, they're included, they were removed from the balance, the beginning balance. Okay, they, so they've been they, removed. Because they're already okay. obligated, yes. I was going to say, we didn't put them in 2018. So. No, we haven't spent all the money. I just wanted to make sure, and you're right, they started in 2017. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no further lights, if there's no further discussion, uh, entertain a motion. Uh, Councilman Jensen, motion to approve, seconded by uh, Councilmember Graham. Uh, that's a receive and file. Please cast your ballots. That motion passes unanimously. Madam Clerk. 
18-171 is a request to receive and file a presentation on the quarterly ended the quarter ended March 31st, 2018 unaudited financial report. There's a handout on your desk that's uh, in color and it has a city logo on it. Uh, Mr. Manager or Mr. Scroggins. Mr. Mayor, I'm going to turn the floor over to Finance Director Scroggins, who has a, a presentation that I think he's going to put up on the screen. Um, and we, I, you know, I'm going to follow up with some questions afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Scroggins. Mr. Mayor, uh, before you uh, tonight, I'm going to present the first quarter financial reports. I provided within the packet the summary that you're customarily see, beginning with the um, fund balances, um, the change in fund balance. So what I've tried to do here is consolidate these within the major groups of funds that we, we classify them uh, within our financial statements. So you can see for the first quarter, it, the total change in fund balance for all funds was about almost $8 million. Uh, the majority of that was in capital funds, including capital project funds, as we issued about $4 million worth of bonds in February. Um, the general fund actually increased about $2.7 million for the first quarter. Um, so it, it was a positive at that point. Um, with revenues coming in, uh, in approximately 94, 95%, which was which has been much more positive than the, that I've reported to you in the past. So um, overall, uh, the first quarter was, uh, was, was a good quarter as it relates to change in fund balance. The next slide I, I reflected in is all the revenues for all the funds. Um, and then I've taken it a step farther and tried to project to where, we, where I think we'll be at the end of fiscal year 2018. Um, so on the far right-hand column, you can see the estimated actual versus budget um, based on first quarter information, which you know, we don't have a, a whole lot of data, uh, but try, try to go with what we had uh, since we only have about two months worth of sales tax information and a couple months worth of income tax information. Um, right now, we're projecting the revenues in the general fund to be about $2 million dollars lower than what we've anticipated. And I'll get more in detail on that on the next couple of slides. Um, with the remaining funds pretty much on task, uh, the, the, capital, the capital funds, based on the approval of the $9.5 million worth of bonds, that's a significant portion of the $31 million. And, and another significant portion is about $8 million in capital or in grants from the federal government state uh, for road projects. Um, the trust and agency fund is our uh, other post-employment benefit fund, and the enterprise fund listed below is the projected revenues related to the stormwater utility fund. Uh, so to dig a little deeper into the general fund, I've broken down by the uh, property taxes, personal property, et cetera, and state. Um, projecting at year end that the state sales tax will be at about a uh, $340,000 under budget. A significant portion of that is trying to estimate what the impact is on um, the various stores closing, such as Bergner's and Toys R Us, and, um, and not knowing what's going to backfill there. So I am trying to allocate some reduction there as well as with the home rule sales tax. The state income tax is projected to finish about a half a million dollars lower than budgeted. That's related to the uh, proposal that the state's still gonna continue to withhold the 10% into next year. Originally it was just gonna be through June 30th, but uh, it appears that they're going to continue uh, withholding that from the state income tax. Uh, other revenues are uh, approximating budget. Um, we, did a, we did a pretty good job of reducing our revenue projections when we did the budget, so we were much closer to budget than uh, we have been in the past. Unfortunately, uh, that revenue is 
projected to come in at 92 million. And I, first of all, I'll do a little overview of the state sales tax um, projections and how I got to you. Uh, the 2018 budget was based on an estimated 2017 sales tax of 21 million. Uh, actual revenues came in at about 20.9, so uh, we had a little more growth than based on the 2% of a higher number. Uh, but I am still anticipating revenues coming in at about 98% at 21.160. As I, as I stated earlier, that, that's really related to uh, unknown uh, sales tax loss on a, a variety of uh, different businesses uh, closing their doors. Um, home rule sales tax uh, reflects basically the same as actually looking at about 90, 97% of budget. Um, it's at 1.75 versus the 1%, so it's going to be a little bit bigger impact. Uh, last year we finished with actual earners at 23.8, um, and we were using uh, about 23, so we were pretty close. Uh, actually when we were doing our projections last year but we only budgeted a one percent growth there um, so right now the projection is that this will be about seven hundred thousand dollars under budget um, again on the state income tax we're looking at approximately five hundred thousand dollars shortfall and again that's related to the um, state continuing to take a ten percent reduction on the, on the uh, local distributive fund and the, the last couple of slides I have relate to expenditures, and I don't know if the manager, if you wanted to discuss expenditures, you want me to keep, keep going. So then I summarized expenditures again by our major funds. Um, right now, uh, it looks like the projection for the general fund is that we're going to be about 1.3% over budget. Um, there's a number of, uh, different factors that are causing this that we'll get into in a little while. Um, the other funds are coming in pretty much as uh, budgeted with about a 1% um, overall under budget. So our overall budget was 221 million. We're looking at about $220 million uh, in projected expenses. The last slide I have relates to the general fund and where these projections projecting out for the year end at 94.3 million dollars roughly versus a budget of 93 million um, the difference is about 1.3 million uh, primarily related to some employee benefit funds that are work comp and different things that are coming in higher than anticipated uh, we've had some benefits that were unanticipated people that had left that we weren't you know we, we thought we covered many of them in 2017 but we had a, a number of 2018 come through so so our employee benefit line is pushing uh, right now it's about seven hundred thousand dollars and and the remaining is uh, in a variety of different areas I don't know if do you wanted to elaborate more on those or if you have any questions I can um, but they primarily is related to legal fees and uh, some constraints in overtime at this point. So that's really all I have. Um, so when we adopted the, the 2018 budget, we had anticipated a spending plan that was going to put $2 million uh, back into the general fund fund balance. We had, um, over the last uh, year uh, in 2017, um, we saw that, that at year end, I think that the, the total amount that was reduced in, in fund balance in the general fund was about $6 million. So we knew that we had to get back on a path towards increasing our fund balance. Um, unfortunately, just even now in the first um, quarter of the year and in the, the first four full months of the year, we've seen that you know some significant changes to um, some headwinds, I guess I would say, with, with Bergner's closing, with the Toys R Us clothing, closing, um, continuing to see, you know, just soft, fine revenue coming in, soft utility tax uh, dollars coming in. Um, so that coupled with, 
you know, some of the expenses that, that Director Scroggins just mentioned um, is necessitating us to, to really look at, if we're going to, to put $2 million back into the fund balance at the end of 2018, we need to make some spending adjustments uh, mid-year, and, and we need to make them pretty quickly. Um, you know, the, the overall um, general fund revenues that, that are estimated as of right now by the, by the, the director are, are 92.7. If we're going to have to put two million dollars uh, into fund balance, that means that we need to get the general fund uh, down to about 90.7 million dollars, or really cutting about three and a half million dollars out of the the trend of spending that we're on currently. Um, I, I would like the the fire chief to come up because you know one of the areas that we've we've really seen a, 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 a challenge has been. Um, within the fire department's budget because of just starting the year off with some, some vacancies within the department. Um, it's led us to, in order to even just to live within the, the $20.5 million budget, it's going to necessitate some changes to operations that will have an impact on the community and have an impact um, on the department. So I wanted him to talk about that. Um, but that's only $1.5 million. We still have uh, what's likely uh, trying to close another $2 million uh, within the general fund in order to, to, to get us to the point where we could put $2 million back into reserves. Uh, if we don't, we're on a path towards not having any liquidity at all in the general fund. We're moving down that path to where we won't have any cash. So we need to make this change and we need to make it now. I've, I sent an email out to all the department heads today um, telling them that at our staff meeting next week, I want to sit down and start to talk through uh, all of our spend. Uh, what, are we, what are we doing? What do we absolutely have to do? Um, and what can we start to, to come back to you in a month with a report that says, here's what we can do in, in terms of making changes to try and adjust that number and get it back down to, to where we can be balanced. So Chief, maybe if you could talk a little bit about, about what you've been looking at within the fire department's budget as well. Okay. Um. First off, I, you know, thank you guys for listening to me tonight, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. I hate this to be the first time that I address you guys to be under these circumstances, but uh, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, what we've done in the fire department, we've been looking at uh, the budget. As, as you know, we were given a budget of $20.5 million somewhere, you know, some change right in there. Um, because of um, you know, being down 11 people to start the year off, um, you know, some anticipated people who were off on, or un unanticipated who were off on duty injury, some sickness, and you went through the worst flu year in several years. Um, we had some long-term illnesses of some of our members. Um, all of those things have added up to the fact that we are, are currently um, at 90.53% of our overtime budget with only 37% of the year gone. So, you know, it, it doesn't take a math person to figure out that we're, we're not going to make it to the end of the year under the current spending that we're doing. Um, another thing that was an unanticipated by us when we looked at this budget and anticipated that we could make it under this number um, w was the amount of uh, you know, vacancies coming into this year. We filled the 10 spots early in the year, so we, we did come up to close to full staff. That lasted for approximately a month, and we're now down 10 members again. So we're going to go through the same thing, um, you know, trying to fill our fire stations and, and fill our fire um, apparatus. So we sat down with the, my command staff. We, we looked at a number of different options. Um, currently, our, our options, you know, are very limited. And you know, it, this moving forward for us to stay within our budgeted amounts, we will have to shut down a machine um, when staffing doesn't allow for it to be, you know, in operation. Um, what we're looking at right now is we're currently looking at, um, you know, if we drop to two hires, uh, which would be two open positions, we'll go ahead and staff those for as long as we can to keep the machines open. Once we drop to three hires, we will go um, down a machine. Um, we'll do that again for the next machine. We go to four and five, we'll hire back. And um, once we get to six, we'll have to drop the second machine. Um, you know, we've projected this out now to the end of July. If we were to hire our 10 members that were short currently today, um, it still takes nine weeks to get them on the streets. So we will pay full salaries for the, the members in the, in the academy while we're paying to staff um, our machines with overtime. And, and again, with only 10% of our overtime budget left, it doesn't take a lot to realize that that's not going to, to last us long. 
So, um, you know, we have picked out the two machines that we're going to uh, shut down right at, at the moment as we go along. First one being Rescue One, which is staffed at Central House. The second one being Rescue Two, which is staffed at the Florence Avenue station. If that machine happens to have to go down as a second machine, we will move truck three out of Armstrong to the Florence station to, to cover that district. Um, you know, that's where we're, we're currently at. Um, you know, and moving forward, we're, we're hoping that, you know, that we don't have to drop the second machine often at all, and we sure don't want to drop into a third one. So, um, you know, I can try to answer any questions that you guys would have at this point, but, but again, that's really our, our, the direction that we're taking to try to live within that $20.5 million that, that we've been given as a department. Uh, questions for the Chief, uh, Councilmember Grib. Chief, um, the uh, term machine uh, is a rather gray uh, word. It doesn't really quite tell the council, because we don't have your expertise, what that means for the people of Peoria. If we, for example, drop Rescue 1 machine mm -hmm. and or Rescue 2, first tell us what the functions of these apparatuses are and what that might mean for the people of Peoria when we have emergencies? Uh, both of our rescue squads are considered to be heavy rescue squads. They don't carry any water. They carry specialized tools. Um, they carry the jaws of life for, um, you know, auto extrications and those types of things. So it's really both of those machines are, are specialized into rescue. Um, you know, when we uh, shut that down, that machine for the day, we will take those tools and take some of that specialized equipment and we will move it to the other machines. Um, you know, so we still have that available on the streets. It'll just be reduced, and, and, and where it comes from, you know, could be an extended period of time than it is now. You know, any reduction that we're going to have, as you all know, when you reduce anything, even in your home, um, you know, it's, we're going to do it the best we can do it. It'll take a little bit longer. Um, we feel by, you know, again, in looking at our command staff, we look at things as an, um, an effective response force, which is we mainly look at fire calls to get, you know, the same number of people there in a certain amount of time. Um, you know, by the two machines that we've chosen, we can meet those effective response times. But every time we do that, of course, we're going to be drawing from somewhere else in the city, which will leave that, you know, more vulnerable. Um, you know, you know. But again, we're we're trying to look at the safety of both with our firefighters and the citizens the best we can, with the amount of money we're allotted to, to live with. And for the rescue machines, uh, is one of the primary purposes the extrication of people from automobiles uh, and or trucks when there are collisions? Correct. And what else do these rescue machines do? Uh, you know, they carry just a wide range. You, uh, you know, there are, there are first attack as far as any um, high angle rescue, those types of things. They have some of that stuff on it. Um, you know, water rescue, they have Gumby suits on them for us for, you know, um, for water rescues, quick response types of things. Just about anything that you can think of specialty-wise when it comes to rescue, those machines carry it um, and, and are, you know, of course, dispatched to those types of calls. And, Chief, a number of years ago, I don't know if you were here then, but there was some discussion about abandoning the underwater rescue squad, and that happily was not done because it's been used just in recent uh, weeks um, we are committed to maintaining that. Correct. All of our specialty teams, we, we have you know, our, our hazardous, hazardous material team, our um, technical rescue team, and our dive team, they're staffed as kind of as a jump crew, so they're not fully staffed all of the time. We just assemble and disperse at uh, when those calls come in. So, yes, they will, they will continue to be fully functional. Um, what the rescue squad does in our cases is sometimes put that first member on the scene. Um, before they can be put together. And uh, we're talking earlier today. And um, are there any areas in the in the capital budget part that we could look at instead of getting into uh, these uh, pieces of equipment that you know when you're trapped in a vehicle, there's an accident and it takes an extra five six minutes. It could be a matter of possibly life and death. Is there any? area that would be less innocuous, or I'm sure you've already calculated that or run that through uh, your mind. Uh, yes, we, we currently don't have a lot in our capital expenditures this year because it was cut in last year's budget. Um, um, you know, some of the firehouse, 
I'll say renovations are almost a necessity that, and that's really all we're doing now in the, in the fire department is um, fixing station four, which is basically falling down around the, the guys. So we don't have any money, um, significant money. You know, we have little things to try to keep uh, our, um, yeah, our equipment going and stuff like that. But, but that, that <coughs> amount that we have in there for this year is, is so little that, uh, you know, we don't see that the need for both are, are, are not going to outweigh what we're running into. Chief, before you um, go, because my colleagues will un indubitably have questions for you, um, piggybacking off what you said, Director Scott Scroggins, uh, I am um, hearing things that seem to be very, very bearish, that there's a bear here in the city council chambers, not a bull. There's a bear in terms of these revenue projections. And as we've had this laid out for us, Toys R Us was mentioned and Bergner's, and no mention was made of Portillo. Uh, I would suspect that might be a, a countervailing uh, influence on the positive, bullish side, but we're just hearing the negative aspect. And then also Macy's closed, but yet we have an entertainment business in that area. So I guess what I'm trying to say to the council is don't go jumping off any financial cliffs yet because I think it's too soon to make any big decisions on these revenues because we're yet to calculate some of the offsets. Do you have any calculations on, on these other entities that have, in essence, in uh, District uh, 4, I think, has been a powerhouse uh, in some respects for possible revenue generation, uh, even though it's lost some things. And I, and I did take the new businesses into consideration. Um, when you look at a restaurant type business, it doesn't generate the sales tax dollars that a retail business does. So I did take into consideration the new um, furniture store in the mall as well, and that's why I mitigated my reduction to only 2%. I did consider Pertillo's as well. Okay, thank you very much. Helpful to have this information. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Euler next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief, you indicated that this latest round of turnover wasn't necessarily expected. What's driving the turnover? And I realize you can't get this perfect, but what does the rest of the year look like? Because I assume that hitting a point that you didn't expect this early in the year, you're pretty heavily digging into where you think things are headed with staffing. Right. We think, we think now that... Uh you know, the unexpected ones that are going. We had two or three, I think maybe it was four in there that we knew throughout the year would be going. Um, we didn't anticipate, we, we lost a gentleman to a fire department in Texas. Uh, you know, we, we had a member who um, um, quit early on. Um, you know, we had a couple of guys take other jobs. One went to be the chief in Washington, those types of things. Some, they were just unexpected to be in this portion of the year. So we think we're where we're at with the, the new 10 that we're looking to hire. Um, if we get one or two by the end of the year, that would probably be um, more what, in line with what we expect to have happen. Um, you know, so we, we think that will balance out. Uh, we just, we, we can't get there, um, not, not in the current state that we're in. Thank you. All right, Council Member Ruck Regal next. Thank you, Mayor. Um, okay. Thank you to our city manager and for, uh, for Jim for being able to put this together. A um, couple of questions here. Um, city manager, can you remind me, how much did we have to pull out of our general fund last year to be able to shore up um, our budget versus um, what it, we... It was, it was about $6 million. Okay. So, so the plan that we, we talked about last year in the fall was for, for 18 and 19, trying to get at least three and a half million dollars put back into the, to the general fund fund balance over those two years. And percentage wise on where our policy states are, our unencumbered fund balances, um, where do we anticipate that if the year goes as we sort of anticipated here, what percent, and, and we've got a goal that we've, our, our, our policy is 25%. I think we were at about 13% uh, 
um, at the maybe at the end of this year we're at it about 13 <laughs> percent look look to, to director Scroggins to clarify uh, based on uh, the current projections of increasing the fund balance by two million dollars we'd be at approximately 12 12 and a half percent and and the goal there was to sort of move it in a different direction than we've been moving so that we can work towards because obviously we're not going to get to that that goal in a couple of years, that's going to take some time to be able it, to get there. It will definitely take us some time to get there. Um, I, I know we've got first quarter numbers here, but we're a little farther out since then, and, and every month can sort of help us trend one way or the other. Are we seeing anything in that month and a half since the first quarter ended that would anticipate, or are your, and are your estimated current year-to-date? Right. The, the projections that I use for 2018 would be as current using current data that I currently have. So through today, I only have January and February sales tax numbers. I won't have March until June, um, but I did have three months of income tax numbers and et cetera. So yes, I've used whatever the current portion is to project going forward, not just a quarter portion. And we, we hear that obviously home sales, um, the homes that are selling right now are selling at maybe a a rate lower than what they may have been uh, selling for two, three years ago. So we're going to start to see probably some of that come through property tax reductions. When do we anticipate that we will start to see those in our property tax revenues? Uh, as these home sales currently will not be reassessed until the levy is done for 2018 to be collected in 2019. And if I recall our projections in the budget that we were actually decreasing the property tax dollars in 2019, realizing that these home sales would be declining. Um, one, one of the hardest things to do in business is to understand that choices we make, um, we've got to be always a little bit more conservative than, than we can sort of shoot in the moon because we've got to be able to make some payments. And one of the things that I, I think um, stands out, city manager, from the, the words that you said there, and I think that it's an important one, is liquidity. Um, Tonight, we had to put in for, uh, to do $10 million in bonds, or up to $10 million in bonds. And liquidity affects a lot of things. And it affects, most importantly, um, the rate at which we're gonna be able to get bonds in the future. And as a city, we, we have to be able to get bonds. We've got some important projects that are, might be coming out of Washington that might be pushed towards us that we're gonna have to do. It's, not something that I think anybody around the council or anybody around the city wants to be able to spend those dollars, but um, we're being told we're going to have to, and we're going to have to go get bonds for those. And so if we lose our liquidity ratings, we're going to be paying higher rates on those bonds for a long time. Am I correct? That's absolutely correct, and that's one of the concerns that we have. Um, and on on our expenses, and, and I don't think there are any silver bullets. I mean, in, in business, you learn that when you plan on one silver bullet, it never hits the mark. Um, and so I think that whatever approach we take moving forward, it's really got to sort of be um, a little bit of everything. It might be living with, the, with some obscurity, uh, some, some retractions into what we as the council sort of think sure. about us too. Um, and it may have to come from a lot of different areas. Uh, there may be some things that we'd like to do this year that we may have to put off for a year or two. Um, with that, two areas that we saw big increases, legal fees. Do we anticipate that the, that increase of legal fees will be going forward? I know we've got the Pierre Marquette, uh, which is one issue that's going to be coming, that's going to be continuing. Do we continue to see legal fees that will be raised higher? I, I think I'll, I'll turn the floor over to the Corporation Council who, who can certainly answer that question. The largest uh, expenditure of the um, legal fees go towards the defense of uh, several wrongful conviction uh, lawsuits that were alleged uh, against uh, the city and they go back as you know a long time uh, and those cases are very specialized and the damages that are uh, sought uh, by, the plaintiff, uh, by the plaintiffs in that case um, often exceed over a million dollars a year. Um, so it is uh, imperative that uh, we defend these cases and 
as such, we are we are forced uh, to expend that amount of money so that um, the city does not face exposure of over a million dollars a year uh, from each one of these claims. And my next question is, is on workman's comp. We've got some, some rates that we're paying out higher there. Um, and I'm assuming that that's also going to raise our mod rate, which is probably going to raise our rates in years in our outlying years as well, at least for, for a couple of years. It has, but we've, we've also been trying to, to, to move a lot of cases through that have been sitting out for a while and trying to resolve these, these cases as quickly as we can. Um, and then, you know, really within that workers' comp case, try, you know, we have uh, been pretty aggressive in trying to recover as much funds as we can to come back to us as well. So there may be some other revenues that, that we might see here that come back to the city as well from the workers' comp side. Great. And, and again, I'd just like to say thank you for all the work coming into this. I know it's something that we asked for uh, last year, went through budget, to, to keep us updated because, um, you know, we talked a lot about tonight, about making sure the public is aware. Um, and and public needs to be fully aware of, of what we're doing around the council here. And I think this is probably one of the most important things tonight, is that quarterly update because it's going to um, affect not only the budget year we have this year, but we obviously passed a two-year budget. Um, but thank you very much for all your work on this. It may be, uh, until I see another light come on here, Mr. Manager, uh, I appreciate the uh, letting us know that you sent that message to staff about the discussion that's going to happen and, uh, and how we can, uh, you said you were going to get us that, uh, the plan in the next 30 days, what your staff comes up with. That, that's correct. I'd like to come back to you at the second meeting in June with a, with a more detailed you know, plan going forward for the rest of the year. Uh, and I think that's really important. Um, you know, one of the things that sometimes the council has uh, uh, a tendency towards micromanaging your job, uh, and while uh, that's certainly not what I'm trying to do, I would like to uh, maybe just toss out there uh, a potential um, for you to uh, maybe just uh, crank it down just a little bit uh, tighter on the expenditure side. So rather than say, um, if it's absolutely necessary, maybe if you say if it's over a certain amount, even if we already approved it in the budget, maybe maybe you should get another uh, sure. opportunity to check that off. Uh, just because sometimes we might think that this is something that we have to spend uh, this year and do it, but you know we start adding those ten and twenty and fifty thousand uh, dollar expenditures up, and it's and, and I. I I don't think there would probably be any argument from the council for you to just have a little bit stronger look at that. But when it comes to, uh, I, I'm not disagreeing at all with, with Councilman Grayab, uh, who has sat around the horseshoe for a long time on the bull versus bear aspect, but what we do know from many years uh, over the last 10 or 15 that we've seen trends like this early on, if we hold our breath and cross our fingers uh, that uh, the winds are going to change, uh, then all of a sudden we find ourselves in the third and fourth quarter trying to make up a much larger number, and you can't get there. It's a lot easier to make smaller uh, adjustments now, and then if, if things do come in better, you can, you can loosen up a little bit. But, I mean, here we are. I mean, it's, we're, we're almost in June. We're almost halfway through the year. Uh, we're not looking really strong here. Um, but... I think that we've got a good handle on it. I look forward to what you what you and your staff bring back with a with a plan for the end. Uh, the other the other thing I just want to mention is I know we have a couple of of uh, department head positions that you're in the process of hiring for, which you need. I know that. But for some of the some of the other positions that we have seen pop up on our emails on a not necessarily a weekly basis, but several, maybe just uh, for just hoping that we're taking a look at all those and trying to understand if that if we do need to add specific head count when things are as tough as they are right now and then we have you know situations where you know uh, the fire department is coming to us in a, in a very uh, tenuous position uh, chief I, I can um, I know I can speak for the council and say that 
these decisions that you and your team are making are unbelievably difficult right now because it, and it's not just a situation of making decisions that are gonna that are gonna affect the, the taxpayers that fund us to per, allow you to perform your work it's also the men and women in your department that are responding uh, that have to be safe uh, in doing their jobs too so this is extremely uh, extremely difficult stuff and I uh, the manager and I spent uh, an hour and a half or so with you today just trying to get a, a really good understanding of, you know, when these potential situations happen, how the different uh, pieces of equipment and manpower move, and it's, it's, it's very strategic and it's very important. And uh, I, I know we want to work uh, with you to get that next group hired as quickly as we can. And I, I thank you for all the time that you and your team are spending to try to uh, get us through this rough spot. Uh, I have a couple more here. Uh, Councilman Sear looks like was up first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Scroggin, I know the, uh, the answer to this, uh, this question, but I think it's important for our constituent to know the process a little bit better. Uh, I, you and I talked before, and it was mentioned again tonight. When, uh, when I was asked and when we were asked to make decision on the budget last September, October, November. I'm looking at the fund summary that we publish to the, the, give it to the public. Excuse me, that we give the public. And under the fund bounds, as that 1-1-2018, one, one, we showed 17 million seventy thousand dollars. This report today shows that as of uh, uh, January 1st, 10 million dollars. So it's really a seven million dollar or seven million dollar difference. Can you explain? Uh, to our constituent, why are we being asked as a body here to make decision? And, and you know, I don't want to say they're a false number, but they're, they're numbers that I didn't know at the time. There was really $10 million versus $17 million. I, mean, I might change my, the conversation might change with me if I know that we only have $10 million versus $17 million. So can you explain to our constituent where that money went? Right. When we began the budget process in June, the 1 1 18 budget. Our beginning fund balance was the December 31st, 2016 ending fund balance plus projected revenues minus expenses. Remember, this was done in June and July when we put this together. So by the end of the year in 2017, we used approximately six, six and a half million dollars of fund balance. That's the difference between the 17 and the 10. When I start the budget, I don't know exactly what the fund balance is going to be. I'm projecting based on those numbers we were doing well in sales tax and stuff through june at the end of the year everything came to slow down and you know we ended up using about six six and a half million in fund balance so that's why that number changed thank you uh, i'm one of the uh, probably councilman around this horseshoe that's a little bearish why on uh, when we make a budget assumption that we always have to increase now we're showing a two percent inflation and when I was a few, a few months ago, now we always increased our revenues. And every year after year, then we were in the month of May now, this is my first experience, come back in the month of May and we're short already. I mean, why, not, why can't we be more conservative in our assumption when we make our budget? Well, actually, we decreased a lot of revenues for 2018 versus what we had budgeted in 2017 and collected. So, I mean, we're actually within 2% projected I think last year we ended at 92 percent so we were eight percent off so we have brought those revenues down to where we believe they they're attainable See, my, my problem mr. manager for the fifth district when I talk to my constituent you now they tell me uh, Dennis just uh, listen to the professional and obviously as mr. mayor just said I mean I don't think any of us has the time or the expertise to micromanage every department in the city but I have to say, I'm, I'm, as, my, as a rookie here, I mean, I'm a little um, disappointed that we're in the month of May already and we're talking about shortage for this current year, 2018. Last question, what is the maximum amount of bond that we can issue as a city? I think we're unlimited if, it's, if it has a revenue source to pay it back. So, so We're it's tied to our revenue source. We're 10% of our EAV if we put it on the property tax levy. At that point, it would be roughly $189 million. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. 
Uh, I have Council Member Montalongo next. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple, I guess, comments to be made and uh, back for our city manager here as he begins to looking at our numbers here again. I think we all probably feel very strongly about the uh, public safety and uh, I think public safety has to be number one and I'd rather not see any cuts to our public safety um, and I think that was something that we, we all came to agreement with um, during last year. Um, second, I, I think perhaps besides looking at expenses, maybe looking at some of the projects that maybe could be uh, held over for another year. Um, and, and third, uh, as far as collecting all revenues, uh, I think we need to, to focus in on what might be out on our balance sheet there that's, uh, that we need to collect on. And I also had a question about um, since all this online shopping goes and then they have it so that you can go pick it up at the store and, and maybe this is more of a technicality I don't know if this is for our finance director or uh, for our city manager to figure out are we collecting all the revenues that we should be collecting under something like that with retail and I just even had that question about even um, these these online even when we pick up food, somebody does an online with one of these, um, um, like for example, a Panera, are we still collecting revenues on that even though it's online? So just, just some questions on, on that. Well, I think um, when, it, when it comes to, to looking at, at cuts to public safety, certainly public safety is a priority and has always been in terms of the way that we'll, we'll look at, at those cuts. Um, but that, that I don't want to say that that doesn't mean that we might not make reductions in the police department's budget, for example, or as you're seeing within the fire department's budget. It's just we'll, we'll look at how we can, we can try and come up with the, the, the reductions in a way that makes sense. Um, but if the police department is spending money on bottled water, maybe that's something we need to forego for the time being. So, we, you know, there are things like that that we need to think about that we can, we can look at and, and we can certainly make that adjustment. The, the second item that you had in terms of looking at projects, we certainly will look at that. Um, and, and we will definitely focus on, the, on the, the, the collection of outstanding revenues that we have. The, uh, the issue of whether or not we're collecting all the sales tax that we have um, is something that I know that the finance director has been, has been looking at. Um, you know, we'll make sure that, that we'll give you a more detailed report back of you know, what, what does that mean from a tax perspective if somebody does go order online and then goes and picks it up at the store and what happens with ordering food online. We can give you those answers. I mean, it's, it's my understanding if you order online, let's say you go to Hy-Vee and you order everything online, when you pick it up, you're paying the sales tax on that because that is the point of sale. It's not, the point of sale is not on the computer. That's my understanding the way it works. So you actually run your credit card, you pay your 1% sales tax, et cetera. I'm just saying just double check that. Right. Well, and the state collects all that, so it makes it a little more difficult for me to pick that out because there's two high V stores here. There's one in Canton. There's one all over the state. State allocates that, so I can see what the total amount is. It doesn't tell me that this was the amount that was online and this was the amount that was done at the grocery store, though. So there's a lot of reliance and a lot of faith in the state as it relates to collecting. We better double check that. Thank you. Uh, I have Councilwoman Jensen next. The, well, the, this is just a follow-up to that to Councilman Montalongo's question and report back because I get asked this question all the time. But to clarify, too, not just going to grocery stores and ordering and picking up food, your food, but if you order something at a Target or a Best Buy, I, the sales I think goes through the online service, and we don't. It, even though you pick it up at the store, you don't use your credit card or anything at the store. So I'd like that included because I think there's lots of different scenarios and they may be all different and constituents are always asking. And if we're advising people to shop here, we need to know what that means. Cause, so it may need to be more thorough and in pretty, pretty detail. 
detailed. That makes sense? Because I think yes. there's different situations that apply, or you know, if somebody orders Portillo's online, does that really does that sales tax go to us? I don't My understanding that they do. But I will follow up with the state and see if I can get clarification on those. But it really relates to the point of delivery and the point of sale. It's not coming to your door. If you're picking it up there, then that is the point of sale. So I'll verify with them, but that's my understanding. So. Okay, thank you. Than ordering it online and having it delivered to your front door. Oh, I understand that. But it, 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 when you order something at Target and you pick it up there, you go through this the same way you do it when you buy it online. So I'd be surprised. I've never anything online, so I can't tell you without asking them. So. I'd be surprised if we get that money. So I hope we do. Thank you. I have Councilman Gray up next. Uh, Manager Urich, or Director Scroggins, um, we have some outstanding um, city positions that have yet to be filled that are going to cost us uh, money. Um, are we building uh, into our projection here? I, I hesitate to say bearish, but maybe I'll say cubbish projection, that we're going to fill some of these vacant positions, uh, uh, and therefore we are diminished because we're going to go ahead and fill, for example, the assistant city manager position. We can keep going. There, there are several. But it, it, I would actually say, Councilman, it's the other way around. We've, we, because we haven't filled that position, it, it actually shows that the, the administration budget is actually smaller than if it were that position had been filled from January 1st going forward. So in other words, it's not factoring in. That would be, I would say, one of the very expensive positions we would have to fill because of the, uh, the rank within the organization, the responsibility factor. Uh, and we're not including that in we've, this we've calculated it we've calculated it already as if that position is filled later in the year not at January 1st because it has we haven't spent those dollars so that so if you look at the manager yes. if you look at the administration budget it's smaller it's under budget right now because of that we're not we're not spending to what we budget because of that and and we recently did some hiring I know in community development too and I guess we were assuming that we were not going to have some of these uh, problems here with shortages and uh, we're being given figures through the first quarter only, but we're anticipating that it's going to be not very good even through June or July. Um, manager, I know that you, uh, of all people, have set a wonderful example. Um, I remember a year you didn't even get a raise. And I think that, you know, even this year, this council's yet to do anything by way of getting uh, the city manager uh, a raise. I don't even think that's been brought forward. I was just talking to the corporation council the other day. So by no means, Manager Uric, am I besmirching you or the way you're running the city by asking these questions. I just, since we're getting into numbers, I need to know th these things. I think the sure. council does too. What we're contemplating uh, uh, filling and not filling in view of what appear to be somewhat negative numbers. I'm not sure it's gonna, well, maybe, I, maybe I'm being Pollyannish as the mayor probably thinks I am. But we all hope for the best, but we do have to plan for the worst. And that's why I think this was an important Briefing, and I think the mayor pointed out, you know, better to make some adjustments now or start to make some adjustments now than to get um, uh, hit really hard uh, as we get into uh, September and October when we start. Well, I think we've already started the budget yeah. uh, when we have technically begun the budget discussions. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I had Councilmember Weather next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Looking at the fact that some of these numbers are only a couple months into the year and we're already projecting to be off a third of what we were off last year, 
and the sounds in the marketplace, I think this situation is going to continue to deteriorate through the rest of the year. Talking to other retailers who have not currently closed their doors but are indicating their sincere concern that they may not make it through the rest of the year, I think that we have to take some very swift action here to do something to start to address the problem. And wasting time here is only going to put us in a very serious situation because we cannot afford to miss the mark the way that we did last year. When do you anticipate we're going to start talking about 2019? I realize that our priority right now is how we're going to address this year, but I think we're going to have to get on top of 2019 very quickly because this is going to roll into that problem as well. well I, I fully anticipate that that when we come back to you in 30 days, we'll have a discussion about 2018. Um, and then not too soon after that, we'll have a discussion probably in the 30 days after that about 2019 and just looking ahead. Thank you. I'm um, seeing no more lights uh, for uh, questions or discussion. Mr. Manager, thanks again for uh, bringing this uh, item to our and the public attention. We look forward to the report back um, second meeting in June. Uh, to entertain a motion to receive and file this information. Councilwoman Moore, seconded Councilmember Turner. Uh, if there's no further lights, please cast your ballots. Councilmember Akerson. Thank you. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Madam Clerk. 18-172 is a request to receive and file a presentation by Peoria Public Works Department for the Stormwater Utility Credit Manual. And I believe there's a handout. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, Director Reese. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you should all have a, a handout of the presentation that I was going to walk through tonight. And really, it's just uh, some background on the, the stormwater utility and then walking through the what we have in the credit and incentive manual or credit and grant manual um, and it'll be, be up here shortly maybe um, so we, we did have two public meetings um, where we had uh, about 50 uh, participants at each one of those uh, where we got uh, feedback on the uh, credit and grants that were available. Um, and, and then we also received uh, comments, or, and we're still receiving comments uh, from the public and uh, the uh, commercial businesses in town. And, we, and we've tried to uh, address those and see how they affect the revenue um, projected for the stormwater utility and uh, include those where we have changes that we can make. Um, and, and then our recommendation is not to take some that, that affect the revenue too much. Um, I, can, I can just start walking through the, the presentation, uh, the handout that you have. Um, and really uh, what it is is we're looking at a citywide approach to all the wet weather issues. Uh, there's some uh, understanding and, or some misunderstanding that this is just to address the, the CSO uh, issues that, that we're facing, but, but the city also has uh, another unfunded mandate passed on from the, the federal government, which is an MS4 permit. And that's a permit that we hold saying that we are going to uh, manage all the stormwater inside the city. Um, and there, so far to date, there, there's only been one city that has been uh, sued for that enforcement, but, and that was Rockford. Um, but with this, uh, as we went through the wet weather committee, that was uh, an issue that, that, that we wanted to, to walk through also. And really what it shows is, uh, this map here shows that wet weather problems are citywide. They're, they're not just districts one, two, and three. Um, districts one, two, and three are primarily the combined system. Um, and so they don't see the erosion that we see in districts four and five and the uh, creek work that we see in districts four and five because they have separated sewers and those and ditches in those districts. And so there, there are wet weather issues across the city. They're just different types of wet weather issues depending on what district you live in. Um, and these are just examples that we have of, of uh, wet weather issues or when things go unmaintained and, and the extreme cost. Uh, this was uh, a $1.2 million fix for Allen and Alta, the culverts, and they were uh, 
the culverts were rotted out on the base, and basically it caused a 20 feet deep uh, sinkhole. That, that uh, I know everybody's seen videos uh, on the internet in the, of cars falling in sinkholes, and this is just a, a classic example of what happens when we don't properly maintain the infrastructure underground. Um, this is a, a culvert currently on Knoxville. It's about a, a $500,000 repair um, just in the it's the existing state that, that it's in uh, today. And it's another one that is starting to rust out uh, on the bottom. Um, this is uh, a retaining or a creek that was uh, lined uh, a long time ago with uh, shotcrete on Florence Avenue. It's one that we've had uh, a number of calls about as it's starting to undermine and there's portions of this wall that have actually fallen into the creek. And then this is uh, Oak Cliff Court. The, this actually is the only access into this neighborhood um, off Knoxville. Uh, and uh, these are problems that we've identified and put in the capital budget for the last couple. I think we've had Oak Cliff Court in the, the capital budget for at least eight years, and it hasn't reached a, a funding level yet. Each year it's one that gets uh, pushed off. And so the stormwater utility is one that allows us to start to address these issues. So this is... Uh, um, just kind of a summary of what we're facing. We have 436, and this is a snapshot in time. Uh, this is what we know today. Uh, we don't have the entire system inventoried, or, and we don't know of everything that's going on. Uh, quite honestly, it's most of this is underground or it's behind people's homes, so we don't necessarily see it. It's not out in front of us every day. So we uh, typically don't know of issues until sinkholes like at Allen and Alta appear, and then they're very expensive to fix. But we have 436 uh, projects that we know of that are backlogged. Uh, we maintain 8,100 inlets and 840 outfalls in the city. Uh, and we have about 120 miles of, of st storm sewer that we have mapped to date, and, and we're still working on mapping all that to get our asset inventory up to date. So. Uh, council adopted a stormwater utility during the budget last year. Uh, the stormwater utility is a separate public utility and, and it's set up in an, or, in an enterprise fund, very similar to a water utility or, or a sanitary sewer utility. And, and some cities even have their parking in, in an enterprise fund utility. And it, it's set up to where the funds that come into that can only be used for that per specific purpose. They, they can't be used for anything else other than uh, Storm, uh, storm system issues. So a, a stormwater utility, it, it's an equitable and responsible way to fund wet weather management. It, it serves as a dedicated revenue stream. Like I said, it can only be used for wet weather issues. We're not able to use it for anything else. A, and um, all properties participate in the stormwater utility. They, every property has something that they, some runoff on, on their, from their property. Nobody is exempt, that includes uh, tax exempt properties that, are, uh, that don't pay property taxes. They're using the system and, and so they pay just like uh, they would for, an electric, uh, for their electric utility, their sanitary sewer and their water. They all pot, uh, pay. But, but we, what we are trying to do is provide incentives for responsible actions. And, and as people change behavior and reduce the amount of runoff or slow the runoff down, we're trying to uh, offer a credit to, to reduce that cost to them. They will still have runoff even if they detain the water because um, there's always more rain that can come. And, and you're, you're not ever going to uh, catch every drop of rain that falls on your property. It, it just doesn't happen because uh, always more rain could come and flood over the, the boundaries. So uh, we've been getting a lot of questions as far as what is stormwater infrastructure. Um, th there's some misperception out there that if I don't have a pipe, uh, I don't, I'm not using the system. Well, the stormwater system is not just pipes. It, it's ditches, it's the creeks, it, it's the tension ponds, um, lakes in town, it's wetlands. I, I mean, uh, the very extreme is oceans that it gets to, and, and uh, then we're, we're looking to incentivize more rain gardens and bioswales to increase infiltration. So currently the, the rate is based on impervious area. This was the, the uh, fairest way that we could come up with to, to charge people for their usage of their system without overburdening it on administrative costs. Uh, the most engineering scientific way 
is to actually do calculations on every property in town um, with, with runoff coefficients and determine exactly what they're running off. But uh, as we looked at, the administration fee was uh, astronomical to do something like that. And, and so this was a way that we could tie it directly to their usage of the system. And, and what we uh, decided on was a 1,000 square foot of impervious area was our billing unit. So in Peoria, the, the average residential bill it, or the average residential home is uh, 2,600 square feet of impervious area on their parcel, and the billing unit is $3 per 1,000 square feet, and it equals out to the average residential bill, uh, monthly bill being $7.80 a month. Um, looking at how that affects other businesses, we kind of pulled a sample. Uh, we, we tried to pull a, a car dealership, definitely not the, the largest car dealership, but, it, but uh, average car dealership size, and, and then a median business, like a, a fast food restaurant, and then a, a small business, so more in the urban core. Uh, the, the small shops uh, in the urban core, their bill is similar to, uh, average bill is similar to a home on per month because uh, they don't necessarily have the large parking lots and they're usually built on smaller parcels. Uh, the medium fast food restaurants, the, they're looking at $120 a month. And, and then the, the large commercial lots uh, with a lot of impervious area, they're looking at a uh, $320 a month bill. So uh, kind of looking at our, our revenue projections, and this kind of ties into the, the previous discussion uh, that council was just having. Uh, in 2018, uh, we're, we're projecting, and this has the bond issuance that was issued tonight. Um, some of that, those funds included in it. Uh, the revenue for this year was about $7.7 .7 million in revenue. Uh, and like I said, that had some uh, bonding costs in there. But uh, of that expenses, 4.1 million of it are directly attributed to operating costs. In that, uh, and then another 4.6 million are capital costs. And, and we understand that that's those add up more than, than what the revenues are there. And some of that is just how that capital cost, the, the way we budget for, for capital costs at the city is we kind of set it up as a bank account. And, and so a lot of projects, we will bank money over time until we actually have the cash to do that. So, so that's why that uh, capital cost looks a little higher than, and they add up for more than the, uh, the revenue generated. But one thing I wanted to point out is last year in the general fund with the stormwater utility, uh, Public Works was able to reduce our, our general fund obligation or our, our general fund utilization by 20% during the budget cycle. And basically what we did is we shifted a little over $2.8 million that was currently being used um, for general fund expenses to the stormwater utility. Uh, to reduce that overall burden on the general fund. Uh, so this was uh, our sewers, our, our guys that work in our, our sewer division of streets and sewers. Uh, they can all be directly attributed to, to wet weather events. Uh, some of our engineering aspects were, were shifted over to the uh, stormwater utility and then our forestry and grounds crews are, are, uh, were shifted over to the, to the stormwater utility because there's some direct correlation to, to proper tree maintenance and, and uh, ground up upkeep uh, to wet weather and uh, infiltration. So uh, looking at the, the grants and credits, uh, we consider a grant a one-time reimbursement for installing, constructing, and maintaining um, uh, best management practice of stormwater. And then a credit is an ongoing reduction to the, to the stormwater bill. Um, and we look at some credits having a limited time, uh, lifetime, um, and they have to be renews, uh, renewed, and other times they're ongoing. Uh, we relate this very similar to uh, a warranty on cars. Basically, people have to show, if you, you can't take a car in and never change, buy a new car, never change the oil, and the motor blows up, and they warranty it. it you have to show that you've had proper maintenance on it. it. And that's really all we're asking, is that people show that, number one, it was built correctly, um, because we at, currently our, our standards don't require anybody to provide uh, post-construction data to show that it was built and we don't have an inspection, we don't have staff to go out and inspect. Um, and, and so a lot of times it's self-certification. So they just have to prove to us that they built it correctly for how it was designed and, and that they've properly maintained it and then they're eligible for credits. Uh, so the grants, 
Um, we're looking at a grant for rain barrel. We anticipate this primarily to be residential houses that, that use that. We're going to have uh, some training that goes along with that in order for people to get rain barrels, um, primarily because a rain barrel needs to be emptied within 72 hours or you really, there's no benefit uh, for stormwater detention in it. Uh, we wanna capture that initial rush of water, hold it for 72 hours, and then release it slowly back out. Um, we're also looking at uh, green infrastructure grants. Uh, this, these are things to help cover costs of permeable pavers from asphalt and, and that initial uh, capital cost. And, and we're proposing, if they show us that they can infiltrate the, the one inch storm, that we will uh, cover up to $1.50 per square foot of capital cost for that, and if they can go up to the to the 2.61 inch storm, which uh, we call our CSO storm, they can get up to $3.50 a square foot. So uh, other grants, th this is a grant we currently have on the books that, that has been coming out of general fund revenues or um, for a number of years or capital revenues uh, for a number of years, and, and it's a private property drainage assistance program. Th this is where somebody has an erosion problem in their backyard, um, we will reimburse 75% up to a maximum of $7,500. Uh, the biggest change we made in, in this one, uh, currently this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So your parcel and your PIN number, is, it's tied to you. We have records of how many people have used it. And um, if you sell your house to, to somebody else and they come in and wanna use that, that program, they're not, uh, under the current policy, they're not allowed to use it. Um, and, and so we're changing that now to allow it to be renewed after 10 years. And, and the reason we have uh, that you can use it once every 10 years is because we're also trying to curb new development from building something that, that's poorly constructed and then coming in and using the, the $7,500 grant right away. And, and so this actually makes a new house be there for 10 years before they would be eligible for this grant. This is, uh, we budget it each year and it's strictly a first come first serve um, funding. The, the, for this one. Uh, the next one is a stormwater infrastructure investment grant. It, this is a new program, very similar to the private property, but, but we're trying to uh, get the larger projects um, in this one and try to spur some uh, development or some capital investment on the private side and to cover some of the costs of, of changing how they are currently doing the work. This one actually, because it's a larger scale, it, it requires a professional engineer um, to, to stamp it and, and to show us that they, their calculations to, to prove to us that they are getting um, the infiltration and detention benefits that, that we're looking for. So then looking at the credits, uh, we're looking at a, a detention credit um, a, a 10% if you meet the current ordinance. The city's had an ordinance since 1997 for detention, and just because people detain water on their, their property doesn't necessarily mean that they're not uh, allowing water to leave the property. It just means they're slowing it down. They're still using the system, and, and our, old, our old requirements actually only required them to hold it for a, a short amount of time before they released it out to the system. So uh, we increased that um, some, but, but we are looking uh, at a 10% credit for that, and then, um, we're allowing for a, up to a 25% credit if they can meet uh, the 100 year storm. Uh, this is an area where we, we get a lot of flooding in neighborhoods um, and, and a lot of that has to do because we've seen significant storm events in the last 10 years um, that exceed the current detention requirements and streets flood. And, and so this is trying to change that behavior and give a benefit if people are able uh, to meet the, the 100 year storm. Uh, what I would say about this is there's a number of subdivisions out there um, that are newly constructed in, since 97 that have detention basins. And if the homeowners association applies for that credit, then every house in that subdivision can get that credit. Um, it, they just have to show us that they are made. There's some subdivisions that do a very good job of maintaining their, their detention ponds and, and uh, take pride in it. There's others that have really let them decay and there's really no detention benefit to them whatsoever. And, and so uh, if they can prove to us that they've maintained them and, and it has held uh, what it was designed for, um, then that entire subdivision or homeowners association, all those houses would be eligible for that credit. Uh, same with volume reduction. Uh, we're allowing for a 10% reduction if they, if they show they can capture the one inch storm. 
um, and then 25% credit if they can uh, capture the, the CSO storm or, or the 2.6 inch storm. Um, th this has been our ordinance. We changed the ordinance to, to require the capture of the one inch storm in, in January of 2017. And, and very similar to detention, just if they infiltrate, uh, there's still water leaving if it rains more than, than that one inch. And as we're watching weather patterns, we, we do see more. Uh, we used to get slow rains that happened over the full day. And what we're seeing is uh, we get the same amount of precipitation. It just happens quicker than what it happened before. So we're getting more intense storms. Um, and that actually hurts our, our runoff and actually causes more erosion. Um, this is something that that's, uh, has been talked at about at the state level. and. Uh, what it is is uh, uh, having to affect water quality. And, and so basically you have to catch uh, total suspended solids. And, and so if, if there's a way to capture those solids on a, off a parking lot, we're offering 15% uh, credit. And, and if they can remove and prove to us that they're removing at least 75% of the total suspended solids uh, off their property. Um, this also has to do with detention basins. Um, if it's not maintained properly and a lot of silt, gets into the bottom of it, and then you get a storm and it rushes off and overflows, a lot of that silt's leaving and moving downstream um, to somebody else's issue. Um, now, we are allowing for a 90% credit if they direct discharge into the Illinois River. Uh, a lot of that is uh, because we don't maintain the Illinois River. The rest of the, it's not in our uh, stormwater system. Uh, the rest of the creeks in town um, we have, and we've had a past of uh, maintaining those creeks. Um, I, one project example is Holly Hedges Devereaux. Uh, we spent about a million and a half dollars doing creek uh, restoration on that. Uh, that was actually one in town that, that we did get funding for uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, education is another one. Uh, we're trying to do it just like uh, recycling as far as if we can get into the schools and teach them and teach the kids about stormwater and wet weather issues and how to be good stewards and infiltrate stormwater into the ground. There's a benefit to it. It also meets our permit requirement. We have an education requirement in our permit so that there's a benefit to us if we can reach out to the public. And so we're offering a $5 per student credit and then looking at grades three, six, and nine for that. And, and then what we wanted to leave it, leave it open um, for an innovation credit. Uh, by no means do we have all the answers and we wanted to have an option out there if somebody comes with, with a, a new idea or something that, that's incredibly innovative, we, we wanted to leave that open. I, I can tell you uh, one that we got from the car dealers uh, that we're interested in is uh, litter pickup. Because um, that, that has, uh, believe it or not, that has an impact on uh, um, stormwater quality. And, and uh, they approached us about uh, uh, possibly looking at some sort of litter pickup program. And, and I, I think we're interested in talking to them more about it and getting a better understanding of it and seeing how we could wrap that into some sort of stormwater credit. Um, so a lot of questions are how to apply. Um, if you go on to our Peoria Stormwater website, you can download the whole manual. The forms are in the back of the manual. Um, we did that purposely because the manual is basically the instructions for the forms, and we wanted people to be forced to read the, the instruction manual uh, to fill out the form before they submitted to them, to us. Uh, so this is the fee structure for all of the, the permits or, or the applications that we're looking at. Uh, from feedback we received, we went back through and, and we changed a lot of these. I, I walked through this at, at the last council meeting. It, one thing that, that I need to point out is we view this as a living document. Um, we think it's going to change over time as we get feedback from the community and, and as we see uh, change in behavior. And, and, um, and, and the other thing is uh, we're looking to not or we're billing in arrears, so uh, it, the utility starts June 1st, um, but bills are not gonna go out June 1st. Bills won't start rolling out until July. And, and what we wanna do is allow people until September 1st to apply for credits 
so that we can go back and credit those all the way back to June. That way uh, we understand that there, there's a lag here and that way it gives them 90 days um, to see the information and start applying for it and, and work it back to, uh, as a credit to their, to their bill. So uh, important part to maintaining credits is just the inspections and the maintenance and annual reporting. Uh, and that's just basically good housekeeping for us to make sure that these are, are being maintained and uh, we don't have the staff to go out and check all of those and nor do we have that built into the budget. Most of our staff that you see in Public Works um, that is attributed to the, the stormwater utility are um, sewers division folks. Uh, those are the guys out fixing the collapsed pipes. Um, on the street. They're running the street sweepers on third shift. Um, that's what the, the majority of those funds are dedicated for. Um, I, I would say we're uh, always willing to, to have uh, feedback on things we could do differently. We have a, a stormwater at peoriagov.org web uh, email where people can email with questions. And then we also have our uh, peoriastormwater.com website. Uh, we did have, it was, uh, Talking to our IT director, he said we, the, the first day it was up, we had almost 2,000 hits on our Peoria Stormwater and, uh, dot com uh, website. There is an impervious a map on it where people can click on their property and see what their bill will be based on a monthly, quarterly, and annual basis. Um, it, we had some kicks in that that are worked out. It, it's running quite a bit faster now. Um, I would just say that people need to be sure that if they type in and search for their, pro for their property, It'll zoom to it and pop up. They actually need to click on their property, and then the pop-up shows up that, that shows what the bill will be. And that's it. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Questions for Director Reese, uh, Council Member Sear. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Director Reese, thank you very much for this, uh, this uh, outstanding presentation. I know it's been a, a lot of work, very difficult situation here, and and the website coming, finally coming online also, it's great. I appreciate it. I got a lot of uh, myself and, and, and constituent of the fifth district that's been on the website already. So thank you very much for all the work. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm a little bearish tonight. And I, got, I do have some, some hard question, I think. Number one, how many rooftops do we have or are affected by the stormwater utility fee or properties? We have about 48,000. 48,000. So we're looking at July, August, and September, if I understand correctly what you just said about people applying for uh, some type of reduction or, or credit, correct? Uh, do we have the staff, number one, to, I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I mean, what, what's your anticipated number of people that will apply for credit? We anticipate we're, we're set up for anywhere from 25 to 30 percent. The, of the properties to apply for a credit and uh, we uh, we have a, a contract with a consulting engineer and that's part of their scope is to help us work through the credits as they come in one of, one of the requests um, that we got was that we uh, had a turnaround time for the credits in 14 days uh, um, and, and that's we just didn't see that as feasible we put it at 30 days um, just because of the pure staffing levels so 30 percent or 45,000 we're looking at about 15, roughly 15,000 requests, maybe. Is three months enough? Do we have the staff for that? Should we extend the credit period? Personally, I, I don't necessarily have a, a problem extending it to the uh, December 1st, and I think that's uh, possibly a decision that the council can uh, direct us to do uh, that would allow us to, to change that. I, I just uh, trying to tie down for next year's budget what the revenues would be as quickly as possible, I think is, was our only intention. Okay. If we could go back to slide 14, please. Can you stop me when I get there? Thank you very much. I've been invited to a lot of the homeowner association meetings in the fifth district, and I've been telling everybody the story about this slide right there. Now, I was a little concerned when I went on the website, you know, that in my neighborhood alone, which I have the smallest house, it's really going to be about $18 a month versus the $9 a month average. Actually, I've been telling people $9. It's really we're looking at $7.80. Uh, a lot of people in my neighborhood would, out, would actually going to be $35, $40 a month. I'm very curious, where do we get the $7.80 average? 
that's just a, a, an average from every residential house in the, the city of Peoria. So, so that's all five council districts, the 48 and a half square miles worth of houses that we have. And you feel comfortable about the $7.80? Because I'm thinking that it's an average for everybody that pays $30 a month. I mean, there's going to be some property owner that will pay a dollar or two a month then? I think there's more along the lines that uh, are paying uh, four or five dollars a month, and then we have a, a general vicinity right in that seven dollars and eighty cents. Okay. Slide number fifteen, please. Next slide. Uh, I've done a, a study of some businesses in the fifth district, and this is not a scientific study. And there's only sixteen people I've talked to businesses in the fifth district. I was very um, curious to know how many types of uh, taxes and fees that uh, we have uh, that we implement to all of these businesses. And I was surprised to see that a lot of these businesses have at least 10, 10 annual either taxes or fees added you know, for the cost of their business. And now we're looking at an additional one. And we know from the slides I've seen before, I mean, 55% of uh, these revenues will come from residential and then a high number from businesses and farm and industrial. Well, I got a big industrial park also in the fifth district. A lot of people don't know what's coming to them and I feel like I'm standing on, a, on the track here and a train is gonna hit me pretty soon. But of these 16 business, my point is this. They have, they pay a total of about a million dollars in property taxes just from those 16 businesses and most of them are small businesses. They employ over 1,100 people in those small businesses. Mr. Orler, earlier, Councilman Orler, talked about, you know, if you have your ear to the ground and listen to business people, I mean, you know, we lost a few already, and there's some that are not sure if they're going to survive or not, and now we're going to add another fee to those 10 or 12 that I just discovered that we, these businesses pay, or a lot of these businesses pay. I'm very concerned. I mean, I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm a little bearish tonight, but... Uh, the climate that we're in right now and the businesses that are leaving, uh, I'm not sure. Example for my property, you know, we're going to charge, the city will charge me $50 for a rain barrel. So, and the maximum credit I can get rise between 10 and 25%, correct, for my, for my house? Is that correct? About 10 to 25% is the maximum I can get. No, so that's another change we made. If you maximized everything, that, that we outlined, you could get up to 65% reduction. For a residential? Uh, yes. Okay, so that makes a little bit more sense since I, I was gonna, not gonna invest $50 for a bunch of rain barrels for, for, to, to save you know, 50 bucks or whatever. So that makes a little bit more sense. But I mean, I'm, the, 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 the most important comments you made tonight for me is you said this is a living document. I think we need to have our ear to the ground and really talk to and, and listen not talk to the listening to resident our resident and really our businesses because I sure don't want to lose any more businesses and like I said I apologize for being a little bearish tonight but I am very concerned so thank you for your time thank you Mr. Mayor okay thank you any other questions for director Reese uh, we had entertain a motion to receive and file councilman Regenbach seconding councilman Turner seeing no further lights please cast your ballots uh, the motion uh, passes with 10 ayes and one nay. Councilmember Sear, Madam Clerk. We're at unfinished business 17 353 is a request from the Planning and Zoning Commission and staff to defer an ordinance uh, amending the unified. Def Development code related to temporary signs until June 12, 2018. Uh, Councilwoman Moore. Oh. Uh, that was the wrong one. Um, just a motion to defer. Okay. All right. Thank you. Seconded by Councilmember Turner. Discussion on the deferral. Councilman Grab. Um, well, if it's just going to be on, on the deferral. Um, I'm concerned about the substance of it. I've already articulated that in our reaction to a Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court ruling. Uh, 
I won't vote for the deferral. I would vote for a permanent tabling of it. Because uh, so I think we're going down the primrose path to doing things that just don't make common sense with what we're doing. And manager, this, this is only up affecting one part of all of this. This is just as it relates to the signs for all of the documentation here as per that one U.S. Supreme Court case. And the rest of it really is just provided so we, we would have context. Is that correct? There, there's a significant amount of context that we tried to put into that. Um, I would turn to Leah Allison, who's here, if there's any additional requirements that are in there. But, but the genesis of this really was that Supreme Court case and trying to be compliant with you know, the decision that came out by the Supreme Court. Um, Mayor, I don't want to prolong this, but you know, as I've said before, this is not going to be a surprise. I will not vote for a deferral. I think it should be permanently tabled uh, because I think we're overreacting to the U.S. Supreme Court case with uh, uh, the uh, grass we're wading into with signs that affect swimmers at a high school and then political signs and everything else. There are too many problems with this. It's too loose. It makes no sense. It's not common sense. And so, therefore, I would vote not to defer, not to be contentious. I just think it should be permanently, or at least as long as we can table something, table it until such time as we get more clarity on this. Okay. The motion on the floor is uh, for a deferral. And uh, without a separate motion, that's the motion that we will be voting on. Please cast your ballots. Motion passes with 10 ayes, 1 nay. Councilmember Graham, Madam Clerk. 18-107 is a request to concur with a recommendation from the Planning and Zoning Commission and staff to adopt an ordinance approving special use in a Class CN neighborhood commercial district for a halfway house for properties uh, located at 1010 South Blaine Street. Councilmember Moore. I'd like to move for a deferral to allow more time for information to come back from the petitioner on this item. Okay, seconded by Councilmember Turner. Is there discussion on this deferral? Seeing none, please cast your ballots. Uh, that motion passes unanimously, Madam Clerk. If there's no further unfinished business. Do we have any unfinished business, unfinished? Councilwoman Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to, as part of the unfinished business, we, um, we have been talking about TIF here just now. And uh, one of the issues that has arisen uh, in both the East Village TIF and the South Side TIF has been the, um, the pausing, let's say, of the residential rehab programs because of um, understaffing. And I just wanted to make the, uh, the, those communities aware that um, I have had conversations with city staff and we have determined that um, the, their TIF funds can be used to um, hire either a contractor or an employee that can help administer that program. So TIF programs can be, the funds can be used out of the TIF program to hire someone to administer the TIF program. And so uh, I just wanted to say all is not lost. Uh, we are working through what that would look like uh, when Director Ross returns to, excuse me, Director Black returns to town, we will work through what that looks like and we'll be getting back to the East Bluff folk and the South Village folk about uh, how this program will proceed. So it is my impression that this program will proceed later in the year, uh, not this month or uh, probably not in June, but it will come back before a council uh, for this council to determine if you will approve using funds out of those tips to hire either an employee or a contractor to administer the programs that are being funded out of those tips. Um, that's item one. The second item, as it relates to old, um, old business, uh, is regarding the, the topic that was raised a couple, uh, just recently regarding the, uh, I think it was Councilman Grayup who mentioned the, um, 
positions that are open now as it relates to the budget, and he specifically mentioned those two positions, the assistant city manager and the diversity officer. And, and I would just like to say now at any, if, if, it, if we didn't think that the diversity officer was needed, um, we saw an, a, an incident that happened recently um, that acknowledged that yes, that diversity officer is needed more than ever. And what I speak to is the, uh, what, I couldn't, what I felt like was a, a lack of sensitivity, an unbelievable hurtful um, manner in which we were advancing individuals for recognition in the light of a tra tragic incident. If, if nothing else, it's an unforced error that uh, said to the African American community that we don't value who you are. And I know that is not, I believe that is not what was trying to be conveyed. I have every confidence that's not what was trying to be conveyed. But that is what came through in, in that situation. Um, this was a situation where this body did not have to vote on that. Um, from what I understand, uh, th that is a, 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 a issue that is addressed right in that department. I'm talking about in the police department. That is not something they need permission to do. Um, but it was uh, an unbelievably hurtful and, and showed lack of sensitivity and that points out the extreme need for that diversity officer. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank those around this horseshoe that voted that yes, we do need a diversity officer, and if we needed an example of why we needed one, this was it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, further unfinished business, Councilwoman Jensen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a, a couple different issues. The first, um, I'm wondering, uh, Mr. City Manager, what the status is of the MOU with the CEO Council. I know you and I met and talked about it a couple weeks ago, so I thought it was going to be on our agenda tonight. Uh, it, uh, I uh, sent a memo out to uh, the Council uh, discussing uh, what is the status of that agreement, um, but essentially um, the uh, agreement uh, was not able to be reviewed uh, by the council who um, was uh, utilized by CEO uh, council and, and therefore could not be ready uh, for this discussion. However, I am meeting with council for the CEO on Thursday. Okay, I, it was my understanding that you guys had met, so you haven't met yet. I mean, I got your memo, but I, since then I thought you were trying to schedule a meeting. This, there was, um, as I indicated, um, the council was unavailable. He had to attend to another pressing matter, and subsequent, um, the same occurrence uh, happened with me. So therefore, we had to postpone our meeting until Thursday. We have had had we have had phone conversations, however, and uh, I believe that we'll be able to get down and work on that agreement uh, this Thursday. So it, does that mean that we think we'll be able to have that at the city council at the next agenda? I mean, uh, well, at the I, next meeting, sorry. I'm sorry, what would you say? Does that mean that we sh it should be ready for the next city council meeting? I would, I, would, I would believe and hope so, yes. Okay. Thank you. That, that's my first item. Um, the next item I have um, is a question, I guess, probably for the city manager. Um, last week I attended the Riverfront Community Advisory um, Committee meeting where the community was, first a presentation was given by the city about developing the plans for the riverfront and, and where we're tearing down the building. Um, and I was sitting with a number of people who attended the public meetings that um, the city hosted this past year on that same development and wondered what happened to the input that they gave and the plan that they came up with. Because it kind of sounded like from the meeting that I attended that we're starting all over again. Well, I'm looking back for Director Reese. I don't see him here. Um, I don't think the intent in that planning process is to just disregard the okay. work that was done previously. I think that that will be encompassed in 
uh, the planning effort that we're, we're undertaking right now. Okay, so I guess that's sort of my, my point for bringing it up is just to ensure, at least for all those people that participated in the earlier sessions, I think that Mr. Seti led, and all that work mm -hmm. isn't just forgotten. No, that, that's not the intent behind that. And that'll be included then in the plan? Okay. As a follow-up to that, I had a question about why um, we were holding separate meetings between the stakeholders group and then the community group, and wondering why we're just not having a meeting with all the stakeholders and the community members together as we work on developing the plan. Uh, so the plan for this is, to, the, the thought behind it is sometimes committees get overweighed with a number of one one side of individuals and not equal distribution of input and so the goal is to get um, experts or individuals representing uh, certain groups all to be on one committee that then can take back to, to their uh, constituents or uh, like-minded individuals and show what's coming forward and then bring it back uh, to the group so that, it, for example, by, like bike Peoria people. If we can get one person that's interested in biking on, at the table and then one person that, that's uh, interested in riverfront planning and that, and then it just tried to alleviate some uh, of a bias pulling us too much in one direction. I do. My, I think you misunderstood my question. My understanding from what was presented, there's going to be a separate group meeting, which are the stakeholders, and then the community advisory group, which is split up into different committees, including biking and I don't know what the other committees were. So my question is, why are the stake, why is the stakeholders group meeting separate from the community advisory group? I can look into it and talk to our consultant and get an answer and get back to you. Um, and, and it came up when um, Rob Parks asked a question about why aren't other people here that have an interest and then we were told that there were going to be different meetings with stakeholders. So I just want to make sure, you know, the community is a stakeholder too, that we're all working together and not in silos. No, I, I think that's the plan is try to get everybody working together and move forward um, as ideas come out. Okay, so if you can let me know and let us all know, that'd be helpful. We'll do that. Um, the other item I have, I'm wondering, it's related to the to chronic nuisance properties. Um, I think the city manager may be aware that um, there was some complaints about a week ago about a couple of properties on the East Bluff, and I know Councilman Riggenbach's aware, and I want to thank um, Chief Marion for um, looking into those right away and getting Captain Green to prepare a report on the two properties with relationship to how um, the chronic nuisance ordinance um, works with those properties and how it will work. So I think it would be helpful for all of us if we could have a, a report back periodically about the chronic nuisance properties and the team and, and what's being done because I know, you know, at least this council person would like us to focus, make sure we're focusing on it and, and pursuing these properties and prosecuting them because, um, you know, I know there's been changes and we don't have a code enforcement person there anymore, so maybe an update on that as well. Okay, thank you. I've got one more related to the music that I mentioned earlier on the riverfront. If you can let the public know or let us know what we're doing, to ensure that hopefully there won't be um, as many noise issues as there were in the beginning of last summer. We had numerous discussions with the promoters and the park district uh, over the course of the winter after the, uh, the summer season ended um, and you know talked with them about the desire to make sure that, that they were good neighbors just as uh, we would expect anyone else to be a good neighbor. Uh, the park district is uh, on top of it and is going to monitor it and make sure that as they're they're working through the the riverfront events that they're they're staying on top of that to to do that. Um, their their staff person down on the riverfront is very aware of the concerns that have been raised um, by the the public and will be monitoring it during the course of this year. That's what we're going to try and do. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any other unfinished business tonight? Unfinished. Seeing no lights, Madam Clerk. We're at new business. New business come before the council? Any new business? Okay. Madam Clerk. We're at citizens' opportunity to address the city council. Uh, citizens to address, uh, name for the record, and five-minute speaking limit. Up first, we have Pastor Underwood. Thank you uh, for the council um, for allowing me to uh, to speak tonight. Uh, and, uh, I'm appreciative of uh, the uh, project or the vote being deferred. But I just want to take a, just a few moments to kind of share just a little bit, just a little bit uh, concerning um, the project. Um, the project is um, called the uh, Joseph Dream House, uh, which is an outreach uh, of our ministry of faith based outreach of our ministry that will uh, help women that are being released uh, from DOC uh, to support them uh, in their re-entry into uh, society. There are many uh, women that's going to be released uh, to Peoria, uh, whether or not this rezoning take place or the program uh, is approved. Uh, that's going to happen. Our uh, outreach program would like to be uh, the catalyst that help uh, these women to, uh, uh, to make uh, better choices, to be able to, su uh, to supply support and aid. I've talked to uh, uh, various pastors, uh, agencies, I've talked to uh, clinics that is very excited about uh, this uh, project uh, because they want to see uh, these women get a, a, a great start uh, to be able uh, to, uh, to, to be able to succeed. Uh, as I was talking to uh, some of the agencies, uh, uh, I've gotten calls um, from them that is saying, I want to be a part, I want to help, what, what can I do? Uh, to help uh, Heartland Clinic, uh, said that they want to help. They have some uh, things that they want to do. Uh, I've talked to different businesses saying that uh, to let them know uh, they want to provide uh, whatever the women need. Uh, so uh, uh, folk are very excited about it. I went uh, through the community talking with people. Uh, they couldn't wait. I have a, a, a petition here that uh, that was circulated with uh, around 200 and some uh, names on it of people that's very excited about this program. As I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, these women are going to be released uh, uh, to Peoria. And uh, what better way than to have a program, which is a 60 to 90 day program, that's going to help them uh, to be able to, uh, to not become a uh, repeated offender. So I'm excited about it. Um, I, uh, I'm very grateful uh, that uh, Councilman uh, Moore uh, deferred it, uh, which will give us more time uh, to get into the community and get the consensus uh, of the community or whatever. And so forth, it's been, it's really, uh, it really has been great. Uh, we have an upcoming meeting uh, where we're going to gather together uh, to, to uh, just to hear some of the concerns uh, and support uh, of the people that's in the community. So uh, I'm, I'm thankful, as I said earlier, and grateful uh, for giving me an opportunity to, to share uh, this project and, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to move forward with it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next is Robert Johnson. Um, I'm Robert Johnson, uh, native peer in a peer, uh, south side of Peer at 1522 South Stanley. Uh, Pastor um, Clara Underwood 
um, didn't state that there was a lot of pushback from the community on the south side of Peoria for this proposed um, halfway house. Um, I'm interested to see those petitions as, as they live there on the south side of Peoria. We did have a meeting. Uh, uh, Denise Moore was at that meeting as well as uh, the uh, south side community for change, uh, the better Rica. All of them had strong opposition against this proposal. First of all, when we first heard about this back in, I guess it was November, we were told that um, she was not to go to the zoning board until she spoke with the community first. She did not do that. She did not go to the community first. She went to the zoning board and they got this approved. We did not have a chance to oppose this proposal at the zoning board also as well. Now, mind you, we do understand, I do understand about reentry, there is a need. But on the south side of Peoria, we already have enough problems. I was just, we just spent, my wife and I just spent almost $16,000 rehabbing our home. My neighbors also have spent money trying to rehab their homes. Nobody's gonna wanna come and live next to a halfway house. Now, mind you, these women probably do need help. I'm sure they do. We have men that's here on the federal level as well as the state level downtown in the commercial area. 15, nine, nine, 15 to 25% of these people will commit some type of infraction that will make that they will end up going back to the Department of Corrections. A Rica listed a, some series of things that was happening in her neighborhood uh, concerning women. I won't go into that. Uh, we definitely want to be a service and a help. Um, I went Saturday, I was working at my house in my yard to get some work done and I went, I had to run down to Tractor Supply real quick. To my amazement and my wife's amazement, my wife is an educator at Von Steuben School also as well. They were closed. There was nothing there, everything was gone. I had been going to Tractor Supply for over 30 years. They left the south side of Peoria they moved over to East Peoria. Tractor Supply is only about six, seven blocks from this proposed um, halfway house. Um, I was shocked that they were gone all those years that we worked there. I passed by there one other time, there was a armadillo parked in Tractor Supply's lot. Now mind you, an armadillo in a business section because of the violence, the shootings that take place across the street from that place, we have many shootings that take place in the South Side of Peoria. We have a lot of problems. I don't have to tell you about what's going on in 61605. I represent the first district as well. I'm the vice president of the South Side Community for Change, Martha Ross, who is also the president of the Pierce Public School District, is also in opposed to this proposal, also opposed it. This was not something that the, the neighbors in the South Side of Peoria wanted. We do want to help if we can, but we're tired of everybody using us as a toilet stool. Uh, so to speak. The Park District has spent hundreds and thousands of dollars trying to get recreation facilities here. This type of facility is not, it's not conducive to our community. Do you want a type of community, a type of system like that in your neighborhood? We're not trying to say that these people need it. Everybody needs a second chance. I understand that. But we have enough problems in the south side of Peoria already. And like I said before, at the onset of this, we were told that she was not going to go to the zoning commission until she spoke with the community. She did not do that. She went anyway, and we did not have an opportunity to speak to the zoning commission. I thank you. All of my life, we have been trying to make improve our community. This type of facility is not going to help us in 61605. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Shelly Epstein. Thank you. You have on your desk uh, this book titled Dynasty of Water. It's presented courtesy of the CEO Council and it's a history of the American Water Company. It's very interesting. We've highlighted a few pertinent sections that relate to Peoria and it talks about Peoria. And as Councilman Sear told me when I handed them out, it's a blueprint of how the company operates. Uh, I talk with you tonight, not about that, 
but about water and our community's future. And here's what I see in that future. If this council does nothing on the water issue that you're facing, Peorians will, sh will surely pay higher water rates. Why am I so certain? Because the past is the best predictor of the future. I think we all know that. In the last 12 years, Peoria's water rates have gone up 74%. 7-4. That's higher than the cost of living by nearly double. Double. Higher than what our neighbors pay for water. Higher than most consumable products. But Peorians don't have a choice with this product. They must have water, and they must buy the water from Illinois American. They must pay these high rates. Beyond that, I know the rates will go up even more because of legislation Illinois American helped write, sponsored, pushed through the House, and this week through the State Senate. Bill 4508 is now on the governor's desk, and it allows Illinois American and Aqua Illinois, the other private water supplier in Illinois, to raise our water rates 2.5% when it buys a system of any size, and 5% when it buys multiple systems. Previously, legislation limited the size of the purchase. Now. They can buy Bloomington's, Joliet's, in the extreme, even Chicago. Okay? So this billion-dollar water corporation will use Peorian's money, your constituents' money, as their own piggy bank to expand their system. This outrageous bill, if it becomes law, will incentivize Illinois American to gobble up more public systems at exorbitant prices because they have us to pay them. Now, you don't have to believe me, okay? Believe the president of Aqua, Illinois, Craig Blanchett, who acknowledges the purpose of this legislation is to have existing customers pay for their acquisitions and thereby spread the costs and hold down rates. Hold down rates for new customers, not existing customers like Peorians. Our rates will go up so that they can expand their system. Now, the council should have been aware of this legislation. I'm not sure it was. Certainly, two of your former members, Ryan Spain and Chuck Weaver, voted against this bill, both of them, spoke against it, argue against it, and you should talk to them about the tactics used to push this bill. They had no support back home, and it got steamrolled at Springfield. Illinois American will use this new power, if this bill becomes law, to further tax Peorians. If you do nothing, that is our future that I'm referring to. But you can do something to stop this taking from Peoria, Peorians. You can pursue the due diligence, and if the financials are right, if financial is right, create some sort of public water system here in Peoria that protects Peorians from what this legislation would allow. This is the issue you've been struggling with, and maybe I'm naive, but I don't think it's that difficult. You can protect Peorians, or you can side with this New Jersey corporation as it seeks ever higher profits. You can support the people who have invested their livelihoods here, created jobs here, and live here, or you can, can, you can carry the mantle of misinformation that the water company is spreading throughout Peoria, and they are. You can vote to investigate the potential of keeping millions and millions of dollars in Peoria. Shelly, your time just ran out. Your, your microphone's not on, Shelly.
Uh, next up, we have Gail Setford. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, Madam Clerk. My name is Gail Thutford. I live at 3600 North Knoxville, 61603. And some years ago, I sat at um, one of those desks every Tuesday night, mind you, uh, frequently agonizing over things like budget shortfalls, things that you talked about tonight. Although usually in those days, what we were agonizing over were capital improvement shortfalls because we needed new sidewalks and we didn't have enough money. It wasn't generally a problem with our operational budget. Now tonight, you've listened to your city manager, Director Scroggins, and your fire chief tell you that one, your budgeted revenues this year aren't gonna be what you thought. Two, the only way you're going to grow your rainy day fund is to cut expenses, and three, your expenses in some areas, the fire department being tonight's presented example, far exceed what's budgeted, specifically mentioning over 90 or at 91% of overtime already expended in the fire department budget alone. Clearly, the city needs new revenue, and it can't keep imposing new taxes or user fees. You agonized also tonight over a new user fee. Your own financial situation cries out for the pursuit of due diligence. Get the facts. That's all we're asking you to do. Get the facts with respect to a potential purchase of the water company. If there's a possibility that a new revenue stream exists, you owe it to the city. You owe it to your constituents to find out. Thank you for your time. Up next, we have Joyce Blumenschein. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Joyce Blumenschein, 2419 East Reservoir, Peoria. I'm here on behalf of Heart of Illinois Sierra Club as a Heart of Illinois Sierra Club board member. Our board did vote to support due diligence for the water company buyout. We voted because of environmental and health concerns, because that is more our purview. But there are some other issues tonight, which I'll mention briefly. Just want to say that it is important that we at least look at due diligence. There are concerns for our water resources as far as climate change, climate change. And it was mentioned earlier about changes in rainfall, but environmentally and for a natural resource, we are looking at changes that could affect demands on our San Cody aquifer and changes in river levels. Also, changes in federal government management of water regulations are a huge concern for us. If federal regulations continue to go down the literal tubes and water regulations and clean water standards are reduced, what is going to be left to protect the citizens of Peoria but actions that we can take locally? All over this country, we see citizens needing to take local actions to either clean up their neighborhoods, get solar energy, clean up the air, and now water is an issue before us all. The one way to research how we can better protect our health and quality of water is through proceeding with due diligence, because that is something that we, you all, as city council, will have more control, control over if we own the water system or if it's found out that we should proceed to buy it. And the other concern, in addition, is water treatment processes. There are standards issued by state and federal government. If those are eroded, who's going to make the decision? Will it be the lowest cost for a privately owned system that looks to profit? Or will it be concerns for each of us and our future generations? Finally, um, Mr. Epstein mentioned House Bill 4508, which was recently passed. Sierra Club opposed that. We are greatly concerned that it means the lid is off on acquisitions for very large and very powerful and very rich water systems like Illinois American Water and Aqua. That means also because provisions in that bill will let them raise rates to acquire other systems. Heart of Illinois Sierra Club includes 15 counties, not only Peoria County, but others in this area, which could see systems under attack. 
I'll put, use the word attack, as we've seen here in Peoria, where billboards, mysterious postcard, house-to-house -house mailings show up, articles left and right by repeated um, issues that are truly a very well-funded and campaign to make people's opinions go one way. So I urge you, please, to consider moving forward with due diligence and at least to give that opportunity to vote and hear the CEO Council funding. Thank you. Up next, we have uh, Ms. Ottman. Um, I would just like to speak briefly uh, regarding to the Joseph Dream House that came up before. Um, I just wanted to say that I've been working with uh, Pastor Underwood, and we had a meeting about a week ago, and uh, and we did have some some opposition. So we um, we wanted to see, you know, we wanted to get a larger segment of the community. So I was with her when she went out, and we did get over 200 uh, signatures, and people were very excited about this. The project is uh, women that are coming out of the Department of Correction. And this will be the last 60 to 90 days of their incarceration. So this program will be, um, they'll come here and they will uh, will help them try to get a job, uh, maybe some classes on how to get a job, how to interview, provide them with clothes, uh, transportation to and from. And so it's just a lot of, uh, just a lot of things that this is going to be doing, and as I said, as she said, we got very exciting uh, feedback on on this uh, project. And the bottom line is, these women are going to be coming anyway. This is just the last part of their coming, so it doesn't matter. They're going to be coming into the neighborhood anyway, into our communities anyway. And the last thing I would like to say is the facility that they are rezoning is basically in an ideal place because. Uh, it was it was a formal church, the formal church, and they are going to renovate it to accommodate um, this program. But where it's located, uh, it's it's a couple of other businesses in the area, and so they don't have to come in contact a lot with the community. But we went up and down those streets surrounding there, and everybody is excited. We we got no opposition to that. Okay, thank you. Madam Clerk. Uh, we have an executive session. Commission Council. Uh, yes, Your Honor, a motion would be appropriate pursuant to Section 2C1 of the uh, Illinois Open Meetings Act, which exempts discussions relative to the performance of a specific employee, as well as 2C21 of the Open Meetings Act, which exempts discussions of previously closed minutes. Okay. Uh, we have a motion to go into executive session. Councilman Ruck Regal seconded by Councilman Sear. Please cast your ballots. Motion passes unanimously. We have a motion uh, following to adjourn by Councilman Ruck Regal seconded by Councilman Euler. Please cast your ballots. And that motion passes unanimously. We'd like to thank our uh, listening and view it, viewing audiences this evening. Uh, have a safe Memorial Day weekend, and this meeting is adjourned.